so pleased. Oh, I'm so pleased to see everybody here. And I appreciate your commitment to the Harbor Seals at Jenner. I want to introduce Dr. Sarah Allen. She'll be our first presenter today. Um, Dr. S uh, Dr. Allen has been gracious for many, many years, and she has spent a generous amount of time with us preparing our new volunteers, our veteran volunteers, ahead of our SEAL Watch every year. And she is invaluable. She is a gift. And uh, we're just so happy that you could join us, Sarah. And we're always grateful for your expertise and kind wisdom. Thank you, Heather. That's very generous of you. And I, I must say that I find this group one of the, it's a leader in how to interface between wildlife and people and has been a model for other programs, including those at Point Reyes, uh, since this program has been in, in effect for more than 40 years, I think, at this point. So thank you for asking me. And um, did you want me to begin and, and share my screen? Please do, I'm okay. very excited. Okay, well, here we go. Um, And hopefully you will see it now. Is that seen by everyone? Yes? Okay. I'm assuming it's working. <laughs> Looks great. Okay, good. <clears throat> so as I said, I, I'm very honored to be included in, in this group of presenters, especially with Adam, whom I've also given speeches to in the past. And we show different parts of what's important in protecting and being good stewards of this amazing place where we live. And what I'm going to talk about in 45 minutes is just a fraction of what you can know about Harbor Seal. So I'll have other places uh, where you can find information and drill down deeper. And I'll share this presentation as a PDF um, with those links to, to other places. One thing that I also want to emphasize is what we know about harbor seals and pinnipeds generally is what we learn from them on land, and that's only a fraction of their lives because it's so difficult to study them. Uh, and be aware that these places where they come on shore and where you'll be interfacing with the public are important for lots of species, um, not just harbor seals. It's a, co a community that comes on shore and uses these special places. So with that background, I'll, I'll proceed. And this is the outline and I'll follow. First, to just generally talk about marine ecology and pinnipeds of which harbor seals are a group part of. And then more generally about the natural history and then drill down a little on the science and the conservation of our area. And for those of you in Sonoma, you know this site well, and I wanna give a shout out to many photographers who shared their great images so that I can use it in this talk. First off, to get us located where we are, we are located where the Red Star is, Central California, but we're part of this California Current, which is an ocean river that extends from Vancouver Island south to Baja. And this is one of only four found globally. It's a coastal upwelling ecosystem and they're considered the most biodiverse and most prolific and abundant of the oceans. And it changes seasonally. So in the summertime, it's a big upwelling and lots of nutrients that form the basis of the food chain and high biodiversity. There have been documented 45 different marine mammal species just associated with this California current. And this current is not uniform, it is broken down into bioregions, both north and south, and onshore and offshore. And onshore, you'll find a, a collection of species that are like gray whales and harbor porpoise and harbor seals and California sea lions and biogenic habitats like kelp beds. But offshore, you'll find a different assemblage. There's overlap, of course, but you'll find a different assemblage of those species more associated 
with say the Farallon Islands where you have more blue whales and elephant seals in deeper waters and things such as um, Mola Mola, which is shown here and uh, humpback whales. So it give, you, gives you an idea of the diversity of species and they're tied to what prey items and habitats are, are in those areas. So for example, near shore, you're shallow, you have a different bottom type, then you have offshore in the continental shelf. And then you have biogenic habitats like deep sea corals or where different prey items might be found uh, to kelp and seal uh, sea grasses that are found in Tamales Bay and Drake's Bay and in different bays along the state. And then the oceanographic features, which are very dynamic and, and prey items are driven by these uh, oceanographic features uh, that are upwelling and their jets and eddies and all sorts of funny names that they associate with these upwelling features. And here's an example of um, an upwelling feature that that is curling in and they they form these little pockets of high high prey availability. And so harbor seals fit into this. <clears throat> and they're a pinniped, which is a suborder of carnivores. So like dogs, cats, foxes, and, and other carnivores, but they're a suborder. And all pinnipeds are tied to the land, though they live their life in the marine environment, they give birth on land. So that's what distinguishes them. And they're morphologically and physiologically developed capabilities that enable them to thrive in these environments, not just to, to live. They have specialized body forms, uh, such as long flippers. Uh, they have modified teeth so that they can grasp prey, or, or in the case of the walrus, they dig up uh, clams. And then they have different ways of retaining heat. Some have thick fur, like fur seals, and others rely on their blubber, like elephant seals and sea lions, to keep them warm while they're immersed in the marine environment. And then they molt this hair uh, in different ways, some on land and some at sea. <clears throat> in, within pinnipeds, there are, in our region, there are two distinct families, the otorides and the phocids. And their body shape is very different morphologically and their capabilities. And so they use the terrestrial and the marine environment differently. And I love this picture because it really shows how they swim differently. So a California sea lion relies on its front flippers for swimming through the water. And that's where the term pinniped, wing-footed comes from. And whereas the phocid seals use their rear flippers for a pelvic oscillation. It also means that they are capable of using different sort of terrestrial um, sites, uh, whether beaches or rocky shorelines. So for the Otoriads, they have an external flap. You can't see it from this image, but I'll show you in others. And they, they have an articulated hips. That means they can rotate their pelvis underneath them. So they can actually run on land, not in gallop, not drag their bodies across. So they can rotate their pelvis. They have the long front fore flippers and um, their rear flippers are smaller. And there's strong sexual dimorphism. So the males are much larger than the females. And this um, is an extreme case would be the stellar sea lion. He's, a, he's about 1500 pounds compared to the 900 pounds of a female to give you an idea of the range. So these four species are found in our region and they, they um, three of them breed in our region. So the Northern fur seals breed on the Farallons, the California sea lions breed on the Farallons and, and a, a, on a Nuevo, and the stellar sea lions breed up in Sonoma County. So you're, you've got their presence. Now I don't have time to drill down into each of them, but just so you're aware of, of these different pinnipeds that occur in the region and they, they co-occur on many of these sites. The phocid seals, only have two members, the northern elephant seal and the harbor seal. So these are the largest and the smallest of the pinnipeds. And they have no external ear flap. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. They cannot articulate their hips. So they cannot rotate their hips. 
Instead, they move inchworm fashion. But what, what they've lost in that articulating of the hips, they've gained by being very efficient swimmers and deep divers. Both of them can then dive extremely deep. Their, sh their short front flippers help in, in directing movement, but not in propelling through the water. So here is an example of a fossid seal up close. And here you can see where the ear is located, but no ear flap. Um, and it closes when the seal dies, dives. They also have very distinctive uh, whiskers, which have bundles of nerves. Now, now um, otorides also have these bundles, but these whiskers are very distinctive in, in detecting the movement of prey. Um, so uh, they can follow their fish by the hydrodynamic movement of the prey. So that's an example of fossid seal up close. The northern elephant seals are very strongly sexually dimorphic, like the otoriids. In the males, up to 5,000 pounds, that's the most, but the um, extreme size difference in the nose, whereas females are only 1,000 pounds. And I, you can really see the difference in size from this photo. And this is a weaned pup, which is only 300 pounds, which is the size of a harbor seal maximum. So it gives you an idea of the size difference between elephant seals and harbor seals. So now I'm going to drill down into the natural history of harbor seals. This is general information about them, and I'll go into more specifics, but mostly understand, again, these are the smallest of the pinnipeds. They, their adults are two to 300 pounds. And in contrast to the others, there's no or little sexual dimorphism between the males and the females. And when the pups are born, they, they are weigh about 24 pounds. So very big difference in sizes uh, for this little, think about 24 pounds, that's easy to pick up and put in your backpack, which is one of the things that Adam has to deal with occasionally in a year. Um, and different from the other species, they tend to be year round residents. Individuals migrate, but there's a strong um, tendency for, for seals to be also resident. And the other thing that's distinctive about them is they rest on shore almost every day. Because they're small, they have to um, come on shore almost every day. And the, the other distinctive thing about harbor seals is the pups can swim at birth. This is very unusual uh, for the other pinnipeds. It usually takes them weeks before they can really venture into the water and swim. But a harbor seal pup, with a little help, within hours of birth can swim. Um, I'll also emphasize that they're sexually mature at three to five years, and that's very similar for all of the pinnipeds. So now I'll go into more detail, but first, um, looking at this map, you can see that harbor seals are found throughout the northern latitudes of the world. And this, again, is very different from the otoriads and, and the elephant seals, um, which are more constrained to the Pacific. I also want to show a difference between elephant seals and harbor seals, uh, because they when elephant seals are just a year old, they can be easily mixed up with harbor seals because they're about the same size. But usually you can tell the difference first off, they don't, they don't run away from you. If you walk, approach an elephant seal on the beach, it will usually just growl at you um, and then run off. But, but a harbor seal will run off before you even get within 50 feet, unless it's very in very deep sleep. The other thing you can tell um, is that they have very big eyes. So I'm, if I were with you right now, I'd say, which one's the harbor seal? But I'm going to give it away. This is the harbor seal, the one in the left quadrant. And you see their eyes are smaller than this elephant seal. And they're, the shape of their snout is quite different. So, um, and if you get really close, let's say it's a dead animal, um, they have no nails in the rear flippers, then you know it's, it's, uh, an elephant seal. Now also harbor seals come in many different color phases and spot patterns, which you don't necessarily see with elephant seals except when they're molting. And you can have a dark on light um, pattern or you can have a, 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 a light on dark. So here's 
those two different color phases. This is called the common pattern because it's the one most commonly seen, but there's a, a cline in the coloration. So up in Alaska, you tend to see more lighter animals, whereas down in the Channel Islands, you tend to see more darker animals. In our area, we're kind of in between and you see this whole mix of coloration um, of the species. And there are there those that are red, which are unusual in some parts of the world. They're found red throughout the world. I've talked to scientists in Japan and, and elsewhere where the, there's a certain percentage of seals that are red. But in San Francisco Bay, fully 40% of the seals are red. And um, that's probably partly related to there being high iron content in the, in the waters of San Francisco Bay and the muds. Um, but there are other proposals put forth that perhaps it's genetics, a difference in genetics, which has been shown with harbor seals of San Francisco Bay, and perhaps it's related to pollutants. Um, but it's a hard, high percentage. And you'll see here, red seals tend to have brittle whiskers, and it, that has implications on their foraging, if you remember what I said about the, the whiskers being important for detecting prey, uh, especially in muddy waters. You'll also see harbor seals with algae. And in Central California, we did a little study recently that looked at uh, percentages of uh, seals that had algal growth, and, and mostly it's females and mostly in estuaries. And I know that there's some at the Russian river mouth that also have algae growth, um, but um, it's mostly sea lettuce. Four different species of algae have been identified, but mostly ulva. Um, and you'll see it growing on their back. And if, if any of you have ever been pregnant, um, or in a Adam's case, um, his wife is pregnant, knows that they, they want to rest a lot. Well, they're floating on the surface a lot when they're pregnant, so, um, and don't haul out as often um, as when they do after they have their pups. And they also occur in very diverse habitats uh, on shore, so you can find them on tidal sandbars and rocky offshore rocks and river mouths and in estuaries. And this is, I love this one of San Francisco Bay. These seals are in the muddy um, expanse of the South Bay where they're rolling around in the mud, red and, and muddy. <laughs> Within the Central California, these are the primary sites uh, recognized by NOAA where harbor seals haul out. And uh, you'll see uh, that there are a lot of sites uh, within Point Reyes and less uh, so going north into Sonoma County. But these NOAA sites are recognized as over 100 seals or more. Um, so you will see many little rocks or even going up the Russian River where you'll see small collections of harbor seals. Uh, but those are not part of the larger NOAA database. And you'll see uh, sites such as this. This is Drake's Estero, and, and the seals haul out on these tidal sandbars that are exposed at low tides. Uh, so this is one of the largest sites in, in California where up to 400 pups have been born, documented born annually. But they also use these broader pocket beaches. This is down in, in Monterey, um, or larger pocket beaches. This is a pocket beach in Point Reyes, it's called Double Point, where uh, also about 400 harbor seal pups have been documented born. And these are very inaccessible sites with these larger populations. But you'll also see gatherings on offshore rocks, and maybe some of you recognize some of these rocks like this at Gleason Beach. And this is, again, Castro Rocks in San Francisco Bay. And this is along the Sonoma Coast. So these sites are exposed during low tides. Sometimes at high tides, they're accessed and the seals will use them. But this is the site you know most at the Russian River. <clears throat> They'll also use human structures. Uh, this is an example of just a, a floating rack that's used in Tomales Bay for oyster farming. But this, device, this floating uh, structure was created by uh, Jim Harvey and his group down in Moss Landing and put into uh, Alameda and the seals are using it regularly. So you can create a structure where the seals actually will haul out. And I've seen them haul out on piers often in San Francisco Bay. So 
And these sites are not necessarily pupping sites, but they're where uh, they feed. So they're close to where they're foraging. <clears throat> so harbor seals have a daily cycle. They also have a seasonal cycle. And I'm going to go into each of these in more detail for you, but just to understand broadly how they're using the sites where they haul out, but also where they are when they're not hauled out. So within a day, a 24 hour period, the highest number of seals on shore occurs in the middle of the day when the solar radiation is highest. So remember, they're small, so they need to war spend a little time warming up and the best time to warm up is the middle of the day when the sun's out. And this is based on telemetry studies where we attached uh, tags to seals and we could track them for 24 hours a day. Now there are those night owls, just like they're night owl people, not all seals are made the same, but their, their predominance, uh, you can get the highest count if a site is not affected by tide in the middle of the day. But the tides vary significantly within a month and within a year. So right now we're, we're getting some minus tides and that's when you might get more seals hauled out on shore. So this is the tide level minus two uh, versus the number of seals uh, going up. <clears throat> and so they'll hang in there. These seals are resting on rocks. The Castro, uh, no, excuse me, this is in uh, Bolinas Lagoon. So they're resting on sandbar and the waters come in and they've got their little flippers. They lose heat through their flippers. So they're resting on shore to the last minute. Some sites though, they can use both low and high tide. So this is Myers grade. Uh, Jamie Hall took these pictures of the two different tidal cycles. And what you have is a, the seals are using these little puddles and they're like little nursery pens uh, where they, they are raising their pups. So now I'll talk about the annual cycle um, in the seasons um, in more detail, but roughly um, we're right now in February and they're still dispersed or not hauling out as many hours per day, maybe six or seven hours per day foraging and then resting at the end of the day. Uh, but they'll start pupping in March. The earliest pups are in March and that pupping season extends through May. And then the females come into estrus after 30 days and the, the, they mate and that cell um, is floating in the uterus. And after about um, the seals molt in June and July, and then in August, that, that uh, blastocyst, which is just a four cell organism to become a pup, is implanted in the uterine wall. And then they give birth again. So that's their, their cycle. So females give birth um, one pup per year and the gestation so is nine months uh, based on that cycle I just explained with that delayed implantation. And the mo mothers recognize their pups by both sight, by seeing them, by smelling them. And you see they spend a lot of time nosing each other, smelling and nosing and sound. So if a pup vocalizes and they're about the only ones that do because the adults just growl the pups will have a distinctive crooing sound. When they vocalize, then that's a key to a mother if she's lost her pup, oh, that might be my pup. But then she verifies by smelling and seeing the pup. And the pups, as I said, can swim at birth and the female has uh, two nipples. She'll roll on her side and then push the pup uh, towards the nipples uh, for the first time before they've learned to, where to nurse. This birth sequence is by Jamie Hall. It's really a, quite amazing to capture this. Um, I've tried and never been so successful, but though I've seen many births. So here's the amniotic sac, sac and they're usually born head first. Um, and then you see here the pup is pushed out and the amniotic sac has not been, um, is, is pulled off and broken. Um, and then the pup is swimming within 30 minutes, a really good mother will take her pup into the water right away and that, that sack is washed off and the blood is washed off uh, because then that keeps the gulls away from harassing a very young pup. 
Uh, so you'll often see a female take the pup into the water and swim, and she'll also pass the placenta in the water within the first um, hour after giving birth. Now, newborns uh, can be, um, they're 24 pounds, they can be less than that, and Adam at Femory Mammal Center sees very small pups, but some of the small pups are born with this lanugo fur that's usually shed in utero. So harbor seals um, are born in Alaska retain this fur, it's a downy fur. Um, harbor seals aren't the only animals that are, have this downy fur, but it helps keep them warm. It's a, a secondary fur. And when they shed it, then you see their spot pattern. But some pups are born with this lanugo uh, when they're very young. And then they, again, they weigh about 24 pounds at birth, but when they wean, so at 30 days, at rich milk, it's more than 50%, they are 50 pounds. And that they're about 50 pounds when they're a year old too. So they don't gain a lot of weight that first year because they're learning, learning how to feed. And again, they're weaned at, at 30 days. So here is a newborn. You can see the, the umbilical cord still attached, just a teeny little guy. And here is a yearling. And you know it's a yearling one because it hasn't molted its fur yet. It's very buffy. So when you see a buffy without much spot pattern, that's usually a yearling. Um, when they're dried out, when they're wet, you can't tell. But when they're dried out, uh, you can see this very buffy looking uh, coloration. And they're around right now. So don't mix them up with pups because they're yearlings. So in this picture, how many, how many wean pups do you see? Now you can't tell me, but I'll tell you. Uh, they're 10 and it's, it, they're all different sizes. So here's a young one, uh, probably about a week old. This one is maybe two weeks old. Here's one nursing in the water, about two weeks old. This one is a weaned pup. It's got that silver coloration of, of a newborn pup. It hasn't molted yet. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it hasn't gotten that buffy color of the, the uh, yearlings yet. Um, and then you see, here's one behind here. They're very hard to see when they're really small, but it gives you the idea of the range of sizes and easy to mix them up. This is also a pup. You see the silver coloration and size is hard to tell because it's, it's almost the size of an, an adult. It's a very large pup. So um, mating, as I said, happens, uh, the females come into estrus about 30 days after giving birth. And you'll see this aquatic behavior where the mating takes place in the water and they have what are called um, meritories. So the males have maintained territories in the water. And this is uh, different from the other pinnipeds that maintain territories on land. So. California sea lions actually have a territory where they defend um, against other males. Whereas harbor seals, they are defending a space in the water and it's usually near the haul out site. Now, uh, Sean Hayes did this study both in Drake's Estero and down in, in Monterey Bay. And he saw, he measured the different sizes of of those meritories and they ranged from three to 21 feet. And the reason he was able to identify it was he did it similarly as one would do uh, for identifying a bird territory. He did a playback of their vocalizations because they vocalize underwater. And he put a hydrophone in the water doing a playback and the harbor seal male attacked the hydrophone. <laughs> so then he put a, a crate over it to protect it but he measured the distance when they stopped reacting, reacting to that vocalization. And that's how he measured the territory. Uh, that, I haven't seen a, a study since then. I, th I know that there have been other uh, people who've studied these meritories, um, but there's a lot to be learned still about them. They have uh, areas where the males will gather together and, and uh, sing um, in these leks, uh, which is similar to what you see with some ungulate species that form leks where males gather and, and then they're depending, defending uh, territories next to females. 
Um, but the, the mating itself takes place in the water. There's a lot of precopulatory play, and most of it is underwater, so hard to study. I did not document it once uh, on shore uh, years ago, and others have done so too, but it's a rare occurrence to see. Now shifting into that annual cycle into the molt, after they mate at, in June and July, they start molting their fur. And this is an annual occurrence. We, lots of mammals molt, dog, your dog is shedding, but their molt, they have to be on shore because it's energetically very costly. So they haul out and they're on shore for longer periods of time, up to 12 hours per day while they're molting their fur because it is um, uh, genetically, uh, energetically costly. And one study uh, showed that uh, daylight is important for the growth follicle. Uh, so it's one of the reasons why they haul out for longer periods uh, on shore. And you see this mix of some molted animals and some in between molting, and they get that silver coloration back after they molt. The reds, interestingly, the red seals actually molt off that red, which is iron oxide. And I've followed individuals and they become red in a year after year. So there's some, some feature of their hair that is, or where they forage that is important for iron, ox, iron uh, ferrous oxide to settle on the fur of the seals. Now I wanna also emphasize that not all sites are created equal. This is a study from San Francisco Bay that showed three different sites where seals congregate and they're used in three different ways. And this is a study from 98 through 2007 really, but you'll see um, all this site, Maori Slough is an important pupping site. And so the numbers are higher during the pupping season, a year after year in the molt, and then they drop in the winter and fall and they're high up in pupping and molt and drop. So it's this very distinctive pattern so it's not as an important foraging area, though there are always still seals there during the winter months. It's most important as a place to congregate for molting and, and for foraging. It's an undisturbed site. Um, Castro Rocks is pretty flat and this site is used year round and um, during the pupping molt and it's actually a little higher um, in the winter a little higher in the winter, um, not this winter, but they, this is an important site where they feed on uh, herring during the herring season and also where salmon are going by. So that site's more flat. Whereas Yerba Buena Island, which is off the Richmond, uh, off the Bay Bridge, you see this site is not, in, is not important during the pupping season. It's low during the pupping season, higher during the malt, um, and then higher in the winter, because this is where the herring spawn near YBI. So it's an important site for them uh, in foraging. And you see this in winter, a peaking in winter. The other thing to note um, is that some years are bigger than higher than others. So this is the first year was 98 and that was an El Nino year. And so even though the pupping season was, was higher, not as high as the malt and not as high as the pupping the next year in 99. So you see this real difference between these two pupping years and this pupping year. This was the pupping um, was reduced during the El Nino year. Alan? So when they're not on shore and not pupping, um, they're dispersed. Not all seals leave that haul out site. You have residents, but some um, will disperse quite far distances all the way up into Northern California or down to Monterey Bay. So this is one study and there have been several since then to show this incredibly wide dispersal of animals and they tend to be in river mouths. Remember that, tend to be in river mouths. So here's an example more with a satellite tag seal that we tagged at Castro Rocks and here it went to Richardson Bay where there's good herring spawning that goes on in there. Um, and then they congregated at Bolinas Lagoon, which is a great haul out site uh, where they congregated and maybe foraged intensively around that point. Um, even went out offshore 
for a while, but then went back to double point, which is a big haul outside, as I mentioned before, and Drake's Estero. So that gives you a range. And then this was over several months of, of travel between these sites. So they're visiting different cities. <clears throat> when they are foraging, they're, all, they're on the continental shelf and they're within 10 kilometers of, of uh, different haul out sites. So they're not way, they, some individuals actually go all the way to the Fairlands, but it's very unusual. And they tend to forge close to shore. And this bathymetric map shows you where the continental shelf is. Um, and they forage mostly at night, as you saw earlier, they haul out during the day. What they eat is broad. They eat whatever's locally abundant. So they'll concentrate in certain areas like river mouths for prey that will be migrating up or through or around those river mouths. But this is an incredible range of prey that they feed on. Um, this gruesome thing is a lamprey. Um, um, they also feed on hagfish, which are slimy things, things that you wouldn't normally put on your plate. But they also like rockfish and, and flounder and sand dabs. And, but the thing that they really key in on um, super abundant are herring and anchovies and squid. Dr. Allen? Yes. We have a few questions in the chat should we pause and answer a few or would you like to finish uh this this bit about foraging let me just finish this one about the, the seal that's got that pink thing in its mouth they Perfect. emphasize that they do like salmon <laughs> there's no mixing this species uh prey up with anything else so um i just want to finish that thought so go ahead and ask questions now that's fine I can't hear you, Heather, so. Uh, I was um, muted, sorry about that. I was uh, saying we all love salmon, don't we? Yeah, we all love salmon and salmon is <laughs> to be very abundant. So let's see. Um, yeah, but we have a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, Linda asks, can the different types of seals mate with other types? And her second question is, does the sea lettuce fall off once the moms give birth and are underwater more? Oh, great question. So um, with regard to mating with other pinnipeds, um, hybridization has not been documented uh, with harbor seals and elephant seals, for example, here. So that, but hybridization has been documented with sea lions. So California stellar sea lions, um, hybrid, hybrids exist and same with fur seals and otorides. So you do see hybridization occasionally uh, with those species. In fact, when you're seeing new um, uh, new presence, like on the Channel Islands, the Guadalupe fur seal is starting to show up there and you'll have a male hybrid, hybridizing with a female California sea lion. So that might happen um, when they're first starting to expand into an area or if they're rare. Uh, when stellar sea lions became very rare on the Channel Islands, their population has shrunk. Their hybridization was showing up with males mating with California sea lion males. So that's that question. Are there any other questions? Yes, Linda's second question is, does the sea lettuce fall off once the moms give birth and are underwater more? Mm -hmm. not, not so much. It, it falls off um, when they start uh, molting. But through the breeding seas, through the period where they're with their pups, uh, they still have that algal growth. And it's one of the ways I follow individual seals through the breeding season is because it's so distinctive. Linda has an additional question. How has pupping season or the number of pups been currently? Increasing or stable? I'll be addressing that question soon. Okay. Okay. We have another couple, few more questions. Uh, yeah. Ruth asked when you were discussing the meritories, was that measurement done in area? Is the area in feet or acres? Acres. Acres. Okay. Um, and so that was uh, done um, where he measured a distance to and then created um, that as, as the circumference of the area. And Pamela and James asked, what do we know about migration between sites? So they do, um, from that image that I showed you before, they do 
um, exchange between sites, um, but an individual um, will go back to the site where they've been successfully able to raise a pup. So a female that goes to say Jenner and successfully raises a pup will come back and give birth again. Um, and this is seen with lots of pinnipeds. If they're not successful in raising a pup, they'll likely go to another place. And you'll see this uh, a disruption that goes on. And I'll talk a little bit about that in, um, as we go on. Any other questions? That's it for now. Thank you. Hey, yeah. So feel free to interrupt me anytime. Um, I'm not looking at the chat. So uh, I appreciate that you brought it up. I'd like this to be more interactive. <laughs> OK, so here's one of the great examples of a photograph that Jamie Hall took of a harbor seal eating eating a lamprey. And this is one of the more important prey items in the Russian River. And lamprey, just like um, salmon, migrate upstream uh, in spawning. So you're seeing this um, where, where they're concentrated at the Russian River and then they become important prey items. And the other thing I want to emphasize about the prey is with harbor seals, their teeth are not just simple ones like you see with elephant seals, they have this scalloping and it helps them to seize the prey and hold on to it. You don't see these sorts of teeth with the other uh, pinnipeds, very distinctive. So if you found a jaw with a teeth on it like this, you would know it's a harbor seal. And they in turn are preyed upon uh, by a suite of predators. And because they're the smallest pinniped, they tend to have lots of different predators. Sharks are the primary ones, but orcas also. Um, but in ones that we don't have anymore or grizzly bears. But the interesting thing about harbor seals is they live in this interface between the water and uh, the ocean more so than the other pinniped species. So they tend to be on islands, or if they're on shore, they're big like elephant seals. Grizzly bears are no longer here. And so that's not a predator for harbor seals to worry about, a terrestrial predator. But there are terrestrial predators that prey on harbor seals that don't prey on the other pinnipeds, and that would be coyotes. They're a big one now in Point Reyes. They're having quite an impact on the colonies at Point Reyes, particularly at Double Point where they can access uh, where previously they hadn't and coyotes were absent from Point Reyes for decades and now they're back and they feed on the small, small pups. Once the pups are more agile, they can escape when the seals stampede in the water. Uh, but when they're newborn, they're not as effective as escaping. And also harbor seals are kind of naive about coyotes because they are a new predator. Another one are eagles that are starting to show up at Point Reyes and they're not preying on pups uh, that are alive, but they do feed on the dead pups. And I know in Alaska that they feed on live harbor seal pups. So that may be another predator back in the system. But again, these are natural processes. These predators were absent uh, for decades and now they're coming back in some areas. Dr. Allen, we have another question. Yes. yes. Uh, and it will certainly be addressed by um, our friends at the Marine Mammal Center, Adam and Justin, but the question is, do injured seals go to the Marine Mammal Center or does nature take its course? Well, I'll leave that to Adam um, to answer. So hold that question. That's an important one for Adam. Um, but I'll talk about the science and the conservation. A little bit, we'll talk about health. So again, uh, you saw this in all these different sites where the harbor seals occur. They even occur on the Farallon Islands and we've had tagged animals go out there, but that population's very small uh, compared to say the California sea lions out there where there's about 13,000. Now the Department of Fish and Game and NOAA um, used to survey harbor seals almost every year, but they haven't done so in more than 10 years now um, when they, they ran out of funds basically and the population looked healthy. So they didn't put an effort into monitoring them, uh, but they estimated the population for the state of California was about 30,000. And 20% 20, 20 of that occurred in the Point Reyes 
Sonoma area. So there's a high concentration of harbor seals in this area, partly because it's remote, it's protected um, by be, being part of a national park and a marine sanctuary. Has, and so there's added protections there and fairly stable if you look at uh, this graph over the past few years. Um, in 2004, there was quite a peak and still to this day I, for the state, no ex explanation of why that peak occurred, but it's probably food related because uh, they were able to, to spend more time on shore and produce more young. Um, and we have developed, we meaning the people who study seals in, in Central California, developed a pinniped monitoring uh, program. And we work together with um, different organizations to monitor population trends. We look at their distribution. We look at the environment and how that changes and affects them. And we look at the health. And this is what Adam will be talking about in more detail. But if I see a die off of seals, I contact the Marine Mammal Center and we try to understand what might be affecting the health of the seals uh, to cause a die off, which we've experienced several times in the past couple decades. And then finally, we look at disturbance and how that affects where seals occur. And from the monitoring that was done both by the regional group and by the Sonoma County Water uh, Board for specifically for Jenner, you'll see first in the this upper uh, graph that the seals are present year round at the mouth of the Russian River, but they're more abundant during the molt. So they're more, that's an important area for them to molt and probably because of prey that come in at that time of year. So there may be anchovies concentrating that time of year that bring their numbers up. But it's important to realize they're present year round. And again, it falls off in the winter, uh, but but the Jenner, the mouth of the Russian River is important as a foraging and a molting area for, for harbor seals. And then if you look over um, years, um, the numbers of the past decade have been fairly stable, but some years are a little more or a little less than others. And what we found in looking closely at Point Reyes and, and other sites is these El Nino years are standouts where they find less prey, so they're less likely to reproduce. And then I wanted to show this and to also uh, give a shout out for Eleanor Tui, who really started a lot of this monitor and she certainly mentored me and mentored many of you who are still monitoring seals there. Um, and so the green is, is the mouth of the Russian River and Sonoma. And you can see for that decade, this is 2001 to 2012, that the numbers go up and down, but they tend to be fairly stable just as they still are for the pupping season, um, but much higher um, in the Sonoma. So again, that 2004, it was, a, it, it was a big signature number for the state and it was a big signature number here. It was very interesting to see that. So one of the things that we all focus on is the disturbance and that's part of what your role is, is to to interface between the public. And there's a reason why we interface with the public because disturbance disturbs a resting period and you see that they need to rest during the day. It's like you and I, we need our eight hours of sleep. Well, they, they need their eight hours of sleep too. And if they, um, they could get separated from their pups at, from a single disturbance, but if there's a chronic disturbance in an area, they might change their usage um, if my husband snored every night, I'd probably go to another bedroom and sleep down there um, so I could get my, my good eight hours. Well, some seals haul out more at night and that we found that in Castro Rocks in San Francisco Bay. Or you'll get reduced pup production. So the Russian River Mouth is not a big producer of pups, but it's an important area for foraging. So be aware of that as an example of how they use sites differently. And we, we broke down um, over a period of years, the different sorts of disturbances that occur at, at Point Reyes. And it's a whole range of just people walking down the beach and flushing seals in the water to clam digging, um, to uh, people with their ultralights who like to dive down on the seals and then kayaking, uh, which has become much more popular. Um, but there's a big fraction that we don't know why they, 
they just dis they're disturbed uh, they are they startle and just like a flock of birds they'll startle and fly off and the seals will flush in the water where they feel safe and one of the other issues that we're looking at is is how climate might be affecting them and sea level rise is an important factor in that because they live in these the interface of where sea level rising is going to be affecting them. But just as it may be covering areas with sea level rise, it may be exposing other areas where they can use. So this is kind of a dynamic, could be a benefit, could be uh, not a benefit, depending on the sites where they're using. And then food webs could be also affected by these changes. So El Nino years, um, there's less of food because of that California current doesn't do the upwelling during an El Nino year, and so there's less prey for them uh, to feed on and consequently less to support a pregnancy. So the, what I want to end on and emphasize is because of these other pressures on them, the disturbance and the, the uh, unpredictability of climate change, having um, marine protected areas uh, such as the mouth of the Russian River are even more important because these are areas uh, where they can rest and it provides resilience for the population uh, where they can reproduce undisturbed. Uh, so I, I can't emphasize enough the significance of this. And the state of California, unlike other states, has created a network of marine protected areas throughout the state. And in North Central California, those sites, um, as can be seen on these maps, are, are extremely important for preserving the biodiversity of California in the marine environment. And um, harbor seals are part of that biodiversity. They're not an endangered species, but they are a part of this complex ecosystem. And they're preserved at the mouth of the Russian River, as an example. Uh, so that's that's the summary of the natural history of harbor seals, and you can drill down yourself way more, um, but this will give you um, kind of the foundation for what to look for. And I also uh, want to acknowledge um, all of you who continue to do this, because without your efforts, one, the seals probably would disappear, and uh, two, we wouldn't have the data to know what's happening with them. So I applaud you for your participation. And I thank all the photographers, particularly Jamie and, and Diane Monroe, who, who shared their, their wonderful images with me. So thank you. And I can take more questions now if there are some. Thank you so much, Dr. Allen. Um, Justin, could we unmute our participants so that we can open up questions? We have a question in the chat from Linda. Linda, would you like to ask your question or should, would you like me to read it? And uh, to unmute yourself, it's in the bottom left corner. I just unmuted myself. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfectly. Um, Hi, so, Linda. I was wondering if um, there's been any documentation about changes in sea temperature um, with uh, you know, going back to climate change, if that's affected, if it's just offshore or if it's had any impact on food sources or anything that has then therefore impacted the seals. So we haven't seen um, changes specific to our area, except related to El Nino years, where when an El Nino year happens, that's warmer water. That means that the prey that they usually would be uh, focused on, uh, such as herring or anchovies, are less abundant. And so then that does affect them. And that's a window into how climate change affects them. Uh, scientists had predicted that El Ninos will be more intense, such as the 98 one in 2010 and 2016, or El Nino years and more intense and more frequent. They haven't become more frequent, but they've certainly been intense. And so their re reproduction is definitely tied to that warmer water mm -hmm. because of food availability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so that's it's happening now. For sea level rise, that's less clear. I've seen habitats change at the mouths of 
rivers, such as the Russian River, where you see it blocked and then broken open um, during a drought. You know, there's less water flow, so the river mouth is not open, but the seals can haul out over, and I've watched them haul out over the sandbar that forms. Um, but in Drake's Estero, for example, those sandbars that are inaccessible to the coyotes um, seem to continue to be forming, and so that's not a negative. Mm -hmm. That's why we document. <laughs> I had one other question, if I could ask that, if that'd be all right. Absolutely. Um, I noticed in your slides, it was, um, I see that what you mentioned, the kind of formal studies of the counts stopped in, looks like 2011, um, I guess. And that's maybe a, a good or a bad thing, meaning that if they think they are so stable or abundant that they don't need to do that. But then you mentioned that you're now doing this by monitoring. And I'm wondering what you mean by monitoring, how that's done to really ensure that this population is stable. So, um, and if not, will they perform a formal study if, ne if that needs to be done to protect the population? That's an excellent question. And I hope that maybe you or, or stewards will email NOAA and, and encourage them to continuing their, their monitoring, which they do by air. So if I had more time, I'd really drill mm -hmm. down into it. But um, NOAA and the Department of Fish and Wildlife would do aerial surveys every year, every couple of years for a couple decades. Um, and then they ran out of money. Um, and harbor seals seemed to be stable, so they felt they didn't need to do it. But that's more than 10 years now, and we feel we other people who study harbor seals in the state feel that it's way past due because changes are happening. If nothing else, the effects of climate change. So that's the, the uh, federal state monitoring. Uh, a group of us in central California said, well, they're not doing, we, we were already studying seals in our neighborhoods, so to speak. And we decided to work collectively and form this regional survey group. Um, so those regional sites that we survey in Sonoma, Marin, San Francisco, and San Mateo counties are pulled together in a database that, um, again, with more time, I would show you uh, the data from that. But it, it um, we survey during the breeding season and the molt every year. And we've been doing that pretty consistently for the past 20 years. Um, so we've got good data. The other thing is that NOAA surveys only surveys during the molt season because that's when the highest numbers tend to occur, but it's not a window into how productivity is occurring and whether they're successful in reproducing. So they're, again, they didn't have the funds to, to do aerial surveys for the breeding and the molt season. Um, and we feel that reproduction is a window into how successful they're being or not. Um, for example, coyotes are having a, a large impact on a couple of colonies down in Marin County, and their numbers have plummeted because of that. Um, where are those seals going? Well, some of them are going to adjacent colonies, but maybe it's a net loss. I can't say that for now. Does that help? So, um, and I, I can just add to that too. Uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife will be, I put this in the chat, um, doing aerial surveys for the whole state in the next year or two hopefully sooner than later um good <laughs> we also have a pinniped monitoring program where stewards works with sonoma water on that um and the re results from all of that data can be found on sonoma waters uh website they do in-depth reporting related to their estuary management activities and um do a fairly good job of tracking the local population as well Yes. They, they, they collect the data. They don't necessarily synthesize it or use it to draw conclusions about the health of the, the colony. Mm -hmm. But those are data that I showed in the presentation from one of their reports. And that, yeah. again, is for the Russian River, but it doesn't include uh, the Sonoma sites um, um, and, and Myers Grade, for example. We have an, an, another question from Harriet in the chat. As part of the biodiversity, how do you see the role of seals? 
Well, seals are an extremely important component of that biodiversity because they're apex predators. They're, they tend to be on the top of the food chain. And so they can have um, a large effect on um, different prey items. And, and in turn, they're also influenced by those changes in prey. It's kind of like the wolf and the, the elk uh, sort of relationship, not quite that extreme, but it's, it's that relationship. And the other thing is when you have uh, complex ecosystems, such as marine ecosystems, having um, more apex predators, more components, you have a more balanced system. So if something is taken out, this ecosystem doesn't collapse. Um, for example, with sea otters, they were taken out of the system. Then um, a few years ago, there was uh, Pycnopodia, which is a type of sea star, uh, sea star died out because of a, a virus that went through and killed off a bunch of sea stars. And fish had been fished out. All of a sudden, you had an explosion of sea urchins because you had three primary predators of sea urchins removed from the system and it made it unstable. So that, then you got sea urchin barrens. So having multiple pinnipeds in a system, they're eating slightly different things. They're, ha they're having an influence in different components of the system. Uh, and, and one final point, sea otters um, like harbor seals are tied to that sea kelp, seagrass system and they eat predators that damage seagrasses. So they're important in healthy, having healthy uh, seagrass beds. So I wanted to also just um, share regarding the data with the pinniped monitoring in Sonoma water. At the end of the presentation, there is a slide that has um, links to resources and Sonoma Water is one of those. And you can go to Sonoma Water and you can actually see their 2021 report of management uh, at the Russian River mouth. And you can um, and uh, view the, the reports from Pinniped Monitoring there, yeah. or informed by Pinniped Monitoring. One, one thing I would add is there continue to be really interesting studies going on at the mouth of the Russian River. For example, several graduate students have studied the relationship of foraging and numbers. And, and now there's a student at San Francisco State who's looking at um, the blockage of the, the river and how that affects the numbers uh, separately. So there are ongoing interest in this particular population. Um, and so the data and the activities that you as a group, the stewards uh, conduct are really important in, in helping those ancillary studies. So I had a question. Uh, we have a few questions in the chat and then I have a question of my own. Um, you had mentioned hybrids and I, the hybridization between species. And I was interested in if there's data on the fitness of those hybrids. Uh, I'm not up on the literature on that, uh, but I believe that there was, um, with the Cal Stellars and California sea lions, there was productivity. Um, but, um, you know, I'll have to find out. I can't remember. It was a long time ago that I looked at that literature. It's fascinating. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, if they were successful, you'd see a lot more of it. <laughs> right. Yeah, good point. So a couple of questions in the chat. How success from Linda, how successful is implantation following mating? Do they have a percentage or is this too difficult to decipher? That is a really good question that would be a graduate student's research project <laughs> and very difficult to study. Um, you can tell if a female has uh, been pregnant and reabsorbed the fetus but not about the blastocyst implantation. Um, but I think you could say pretty confidently that females mate every year, mm -hmm. uh, but they don't reproduce every year. Whether they reabsorb the fetus or the, it, the blastocyst never implants, I don't know. 
but we do have data on individuals skipping years, and those years are associated with uh, poor productivity, um, less food to carry a pregnancy. And that's the same for elephant seals or harbor seals or California sea lions. They skip years, and, and you probably, and Adam will go into this quite a bit, where uh, the female California sea lions abandon their, their pups, or, or fur seals too, abandon their pups. Usually they stay with them for six months. They'll abandon them because they don't have enough food to nurse them. So please also feel free to, to um, ask your questions. You're not limited to the chat once we open it up. Um, we do have some extra time. Um, we have about five more minutes. So uh, we have an, one more question in the chat from Pamela and James. As to migration, what is the typical range of an individual? Might you find a harbor seal from Russian River in San Francisco Bay, further south perhaps? Yes, <laughs> yes to both. Uh, usually, um, not usually, but from the animals that we satellite tagged and, and radio tagged, some moved uh, from San Francisco Bay all the way up uh, to the border of California. Um, and those were young animals. Um, and Adam probably has some of those animals when they released them after being uh, cared for at the Marine Mammal Center, but also ones that we tag. Um, so they can range very far. I don't have percentages on the difference, but I did have data from uh, one of the studies where almost half of the animals didn't move at all. So you've got residents, it's just like a city. You've got people who hang out and they don't like to travel. And then you've got those wanderers and they're not always young animals, males. Well, I think one of the, uh, the studies showed that the, the ones and the couple of animals that went to the Fairlands were mostly males. Um, so uh, you get different behaviors depending on the sex too. But what was really important is the animals would come back to the site to breed, to reproduce. So animals that I tagged at Point Reyes went north and south. Some went to the Russian River and hung out. Some went further north. Some went to Tomales Bay and then just hung out there. But they, then they would go back to, point, to the Point Reyes area where they, were, they gave birth the previous year. So uh, there's an importance of remoteness for reproduction, but not exclusively for that. Mm -hmm. Carol, would you like to ask your question? Or would you like me to read it? Go ahead and read it. Okay, Carol is one of our amazing volunteers who's been part of the Steel Watch Working Group. And um, so really happy, Carol, that you're here. And thank you so much for all of your work. Carol asks, I've seen different theories about why delayed implantation serves the species. Do you have any ideas about that? Um, one, one theory that seems to make more the most sense is that it's tied uh, to when a pup is weaned, the sort of prey that might be available for them to feed on and survive that year. And you tend to see um, that sort of variation in productivity of, of prey in cycles of in temperate regions. So we're in a, in a temperate area, not a tropical area. And so you've got herring that are spawning certain times and, and anchovies spawn at certain times. So you maximize, if you give birth and wean your pup at such and such a time, you're maximizing the availability of food. If you look at pinnipeds in the tropics, they don't have that sort of annual cycle with delayed implantation. They'll, they'll pup at different times. And, and uh, I, I don't know specifically for, uh, for monk seals, for example, in Hawaii, but they'll have pups throughout the year. And it's not just in a very distinct period as you find in temperate areas. Uh, so that's the best explanation I've read about, but I'm sure there are other theories that people will drill down on and, and try and show correlations. Uh, so I saw in the chat, somebody asked about the lifespan of uh, local seals and that's, um, I think the oldest seal ever documented was about 30 years, 
uh, but in in they live about 20 years in the wild on average. And I, I followed individuals for 10 plus years and they were already adults. So uh, that gives you a window into to length of age. Dr. Miller, I have a question. We have, when we're volunteering, we often get questions about their predators, the harbor seals predators at the Jenner haul out. And you, you discussed that earlier. You mentioned sharks and some orcas. How generally, how far offshore do seals um, hunt? How far, how deep do they dive? What is their risk or exposure to risk to predators in that um, area of the Russian River mouth? Oh, it's big. <laughs> uh, because you tend to see those sorts of predators um, where seals are concentrated. So uh, I can give the, the site I know better is Point Race Headlands and harbor seals stick close to shore. They feed in the surf zone. So that's an area where orcas have a hard time detecting a harbor seal because of the wave and the shoreline. Um, and sharks um, can't detect them easily in that surf zone. But there's also a lot of prey, surf perch, et cetera, that they can focus on in that, that zone. Um, so um, elephant seals will, even though they're deep divers and can dive a mile deep, when they get to Point Race Headlands, they are hugging the shoreline. They are not in the middle of Drake's Bay because they're not, they're at risk to sharks or orcas. Um, harbor seals can dive a thousand feet. So they can go out in deeper water and dive, but they tend to feed on the continental shelf and they tend to feed close to shore within a quarter mile, which is a thousand feet. That's not very far. Uh, so they're keen in, right now, I've been watching them in Tomales Bay feeding on herring and uh, Tomales Bay is deepest, on average is 20 feet deep. Um, and so they're, that's where they're foraging right now in the area. Does well, that answer your question? Yes, it did. Thank you. It's a, it's a common question that I, I get quite often. One thing is they're not sure how to respond to these terrestrial predators. Dogs they're very reactive to. Well, coyotes are like a dog, um, mm -hmm. but they cooperate. Uh, so you could have two coyotes working uh, to isolate a pup from its mother. And, and kill it. And so that that's new and that's something that they're adapting to. So we have a few questions in the chat, but we are, um, we're at time. So well, we I can answer in the chat. Um, That'd be wonderful, thank yes. you. And, and Dr. Uh, Allen, thank you so much. Well, this is you. always so wonderful and can't thank you enough for sharing your expertise and time with us this morning. Well, thank you again for inviting me and I will uh, share this re recording with some links to drill down deeper because there's much, much more. And I'm just one individual that knows one story. There are lots of stories and Adam's got some great stories too. So thank you for, for inviting me. So folks, we're gonna have a 10 minute break. And we'll see you back at 1025 Sharp and Adam Ratner and Justin Hodges with the Marine Mammal Center will be our next presenters. So enjoy, get some coffee, stretch your legs. We'll see you in 10 minutes. Okay. So welcome back. It is 1025. We'll give another minute for everyone to, to settle in. I hope you got some, some coffee. I'll just give it another minute. Okay, let's get started. So our next presenters are Adam Ratner and Justin Hodges from the Marine Mammal Center. Adam is the Associate Director of Conservation Education. He oversees the Center's Education and Communication Initiatives aimed 
at addressing global ocean threats, such as climate change, ocean trash, and marine mammal harassment. By providing hopeful stories of action and tangible solutions, Adam helps people find inspiration and empowerment to become the heroes of their own environment and community. Justin Hodges is the Northern Range Operations Manager at the Marine Mammal Center. He oversees the center's response capabilities from San Mateo County to Mendocino County and east to Yolo County. He is responsible for recruiting and training new response volunteers, which I am one, and manages the day-to-day -day response operations in conjunction with the dispatch, excuse me, dispatch office. So with that, welcome Adam and Justin. You're welcome to take over the screen when you are ready to get started. And again, folks, please um, put your questions in the chat. We'll pause throughout the presentation, have the opportunity to discuss them. And then if time allows at the end of the presentation, we'll open it up for discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much, Heather, and just so wonderful to see all your faces and have you joining us today. What a pleasure to follow Sarah Allen as well. Um, just such a wealth of information. So please continue to ask questions. We're going to take it in a slightly different direction from what you heard with um, Dr. Allen's presentation earlier. We're going to focus on kind of what are some of the threats to harbor seals? What are some of the stories behind it and how we can help protect them? Heather, would you mind uh, stop sharing your screen for a second? I would just love to see um, the faces and kind of the blocks for a moment before I share my screen. And just while you're doing that, a quick note for everybody. Uh, Adam will be sharing his screen and sort of advancing the slides. We'll be trading off who's talking about what. Um, but that means I'll have the ability to monitor chat pretty well. Um, so I have an idea of if you have a question that comes up as the conversation is flowing, whether or not it needs to be answered immediately or it'll be something that'll become later in the talk. So, you know, we'll, we'll be keeping an eye on it sort of tandemly. Excellent. Thanks, Justin. And I know we've got some people on video, some otherwise, but before I go to a point where I can no longer see any of your faces, I am just curious by a show of a physical hand or virtual hand, um, how many folks are familiar with the Marine Mammal Center at this point? All right, I'm seeing lots of hands. Um, I know for a fact that um, Heather, as well as uh, Martha and Roger, are intimately connected to the Marine Mammal Center as volunteers. Is there anyone else that I'm missing here just by a show of hands that is a volunteer with us or has kind of a deep, rich history with the Marine Mammal Center? Okay. Good to just have a sense of who's in the room. Um, all right, let's go ahead and share screen here. We'll kind of walk through uh, a few different slides, mostly just to be able to show you some really cute photos more than anything else. Um, I refuse to give a talk about Harbor Seals without having ridiculous amounts of cute photos. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna walk through just really briefly, what is the Marine Mammal Center? What's our role? How does it connect to what you are doing? And then we're gonna tell you some stories about some Harbor Seals that we've taken care of. So first and foremost, the Marine Mammal Center is really a global leader in ocean conservation. And we do it through the rescue, rehabilitation, and release of sick and injured marine mammals. So we serve as actually the world's largest marine mammal hospital. We do it through scientific research, and we do it through education. And thinking of how do we take the stories of these sick and injured seals and sea lions and identify ways to not only create solutions to keep the seals and sea lions safe, but actually create a healthier ocean for marine mammals and people alike. We do it through an amazing community of support, some of which are on this call with us today. So we're doing this work up and down the California coast, over 600 miles, stretching from Mendocino County in the north down to San Luis Obispo County in the south. We have a hospital actually out on the big island of Hawaii to help support some of the endangered monk seals that are out there. And of course, beyond just the animals we're rescuing, what we're learning about these animals, the training, the education programs is having a global impact. And it is only because of the support from the community that we can do this. So we're a nonprofit. We run almost entirely on donations. We're almost entirely volunteer driven. So we've got just over a hundred staff 
but 1,300 volunteers that do literally everything for us. Some of the rescues, the releases, the basic medical procedures, feedings, cleanings, education work. They start at 15. They go up to age 97. We don't even cut it off at 97. So it just gives you a sense of what is allowing us to do some of the work you're going to hear about today. Most likely, you're familiar, if you know of the Marine Mammal Center, with the response and rescue work. This is something we've been doing for over 45 years, where if there's a sick or injured seal, sea lion, whale, dolphin, otter, located anywhere within those 600 miles of California coast or out in Hawaii, we're going to try and help it. Whether that's a sea otter down in San Luis Obispo, or maybe it's an entangled whale swimming along the Monterey Bay coastline. We're going to be able to send a team of trained responders out there, evaluate, is this something where the animal can benefit from being rescued? And if so, let's either get them to the hospital or in the case of whales, make a house call and administer care to them out in the wild. We have a 24-hour hotline. and We rely on the public to be our eyes and ears, 415-289-SEAL. And we're going to get upwards of 10,000 calls a year from people out on the beaches letting us know what they're seeing. If an animal does need to be rescued, we've got a site down in San Luis Obispo, we've got a site in Moss Landing that can act as triage, and all of the animals along that 600 mile range will come to our Sausalito headquarters, where basically we can do any test you can get at a human hospital for these animals. We can have upwards of 290 animals at the hospital at once. We've got volunteers preparing food for them. We've got veterinarians that can do things ranging from ultrasounds to x-rays to brain scans and surgeries. Um, this sea otter in the top left corner was the lucky recipient of a root canal to fix a tooth problem. Um, so really anything that we need to do to get these animals healthy and ready back for the wild, we can do in Sausalito. And that truly is the goal for every patient that we're rescuing. No one wants to spend their time at a hospital. So the day they feel better is the day they get released back out to the ocean with a second chance at life. The story doesn't end there though, because we want to eventually just stop rescuing sick and injured animals. We'd much rather have them be healthy out in the wild. And that's where scientific research plays a really big role. We're gonna publish anywhere from around 10 to 20 scientific papers every single year, work on around 60 different research projects with global partners. And it can range from diagnosing different issues, like you see with our lab technician, Carlos, on the right, we were the first to discover cancer in California sea lions. We've been the first to discover different parasites and ailments that these animals face. We study animals that are kind of washing up on the beaches, so maybe not part of the rehabilitation work, but if a whale strands along the coast, we'll send a team out and do an animal autopsy or a necropsy to understand what's happening for those animals. That can help inform things like policy changes with shipping lanes and fishing gear use. And then in the bottom left, you see a Guadalupe fur seal with a satellite tag attached to its back. So actually tracking these animals, making sure they're doing okay after they've been at the hospital and shining a light on what are some of the migration patterns for these animals, just like you were asking about for some of the harbor seals that you might see off the Sonoma coast. And then, of course, lastly, the education work. And you're going to hear a little bit from me today. My background's within kind of marine biology and research, but transitioned into education. And you've got Justin, who is deep in the heart of that rescue and response work. So hopefully we'll be able to address all your questions today. When it comes to the education work, it really is split between two groups. Our goal is to inspire the next generation of scientists and stewards. So we're a training hospital and a teaching hospital where we have visiting veterinarians, pathologists, and scientists coming to learn how to do all of this and bring it back to maybe their organization, whether it's somewhere in California, somewhere in the United States, or actually global, where we help train and set up hospitals around the world. We also work a lot with students, particularly middle school and high school students, and help them on that career path to how they can be a hero of their own environment. One of the best ways people can do this is simply by visiting. We're open to the public. It's free admission to actually come and see the animals in Sausalito, talk with some of our experts, and see how you can get more involved. 
Now, the last few things before we dive into the specific stories is I wanted to just zoom out to give a sense of the scale and scope of the types of animals that we might be taking care of. Every year is going to be a little bit different. We might rescue anywhere from around 500 animals up to close to 2,000 animals. And they range from the California sea lions and the elephant seals and harbor seals that you might be really familiar with along the coast to some of the more threatened and endangered species, whether that's the Guadalupe fur seals, that's the thing on the right that looks like a furry version of Yoda, um, to the endangered Hawaiian monk seals, to the adorable but vicious southern sea otters, and then things like the dolphins and the whales as well. What we want to do with you today, though, in our time is actually just tell you three stories. And we're going to focus just on the harbor seals, particularly ones that actually come from your region at Goat Rock Beach. So we're going to tell you the story of Nomi, we're going to tell you the story of Fry, and we're going to tell you the story of this little guy, Naya. So let's start with Nomi for a second here. And this is a pretty young animal. We got a phone call from someone out at Goat Rock Beach. It was a family just walking along the beach. They stumbled across this animal and they realized, you know, something's not quite right here. Um, they decided to get on the phone. They called the Marine Mammal Center. We started asking them some questions and we realized, yeah, this is an animal that we want to go out. We want to see this animal. We want to make sure that we have eyes on it. And if it needs to be rescued and is truly sick, we can bring it to the hospital. And when we got out there, we identified um, this umbilical cord that you can see. Um, and actually looking at the color, the size, the condition of that, we were able to age this animal to only one to three days old. So this is an animal clearly separated from mom very prematurely, all by itself on the beach, needing help. Bring it back to the hospital, we also identified it had various puncture wounds on its back. And out on the beach, it's hard to diagnose some of these things. Um, they could get puncture wounds from dogs that have bitten. So off-leash dogs, it could be birds, other different um, animals out there. But clearly, this is an animal that needed help. So one of the big things that we're always going to do is relying on the public to help us understand what they're seeing, when we need to get out there, and then equipping our volunteers with the skills and the insights and the materials to be able to rescue it. And that's where I'll turn it over to Justin to kind of walk us through a little bit of the process of what happens when you see a sick animal like Nomi out on the beach. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Good, uh, good summary. Um, so yeah, as Adam said, the first and foremost thing we have is you guys or the members of the public, right? You see an animal out there and you think this isn't quite right, right? Um, and no matter what that is, it can range from something fairly obvious, like this little furry harbor seal or something less obvious, like a sea lion that may just be resting, right? But if you think something is wrong, give us a call at that number, the hotline 415-289-SEAL. Um, so just, you know, based on stuff that you heard Adam talk about, based on Dr. Allen's presentation, um, you can go ahead and type it in the chat, but what, uh, what do you see in this photo that we got, um, about this animal that may be sort of distressing, right? Some kind of physical characteristics, um, maybe around the animal and anything like that. Um, do you see, you know, that Lanugo coat that Dr. Allen talked about that, you know, may be a, a sign of premature birth? Um, do you see the umbilicus? Um, how big is the animal? You know, this guy looks pretty small, kind of windsock shaped, you know, he's got that, those fur rolls and stuff indicating he may not be as healthy and fat as he should be. Um, any wounds that you can see, right? It may be difficult, as Adam said, to see puncture wounds, that kind of stuff. Um, are there any people and dogs around that'll disturb this animal? Um, I'm seeing a, a dog print photo there in the sand right next to the animal that looks fairly fresh, right? So that means some sort of canid ran up on it. Um, any other wild animals around in the area? You know, Dr. Allen talked about predation from coyotes and that kind of stuff happening. Um, do we see any evidence of that? Um, so yeah, we take all of this into account, you know, we want you to, to start looking for these things, right? And that's the kind of stuff that our dispatch team will start asking you if you call into the hotline, you know, what, what are you seeing? What, what sense of urgency do we need to have with this animal? Is it okay? Is it not okay? Um, and, you know, as Adam said, spoiler alert, this animal was not okay. Based on a lot of these things, we determined that it is a very young animal based on that Lanugo coat, based on the uh, the freshness of that umbilicus. Um, we sort of rate the umbilicus on how uh, how juicy it is, is the term we like to use in the office, a little bit gruesome, but you know how pink and fleshy it looks, how sort of plump it is, 
all the way down to sort of a jerky like texture where it's about to fall off right if it's that fresh and pink and kind of juicy we know that the animal may have just you know within the last couple of days uh been birthed so we take all this into account to help determine what we do next which is get our responders going and out out into the field right but we don't want to send them with everything and we don't want to send them with nothing right so this is sort of this photo kind of displays a, a general sort of what you might see on the truck. Um, we have carriers of various sizes and the 300, 400, 500, 700. That's all sort of manufacturer sizing. Um, and we just use it as our nomenclature to kind of talk about, hey, throw a 300 on the truck because it's a small animal. Um, we have a PVC, uh, we call them auto racks, but we use them for Harbor Seal pups as well. What that does is it gets the animal up off the bottom of the carrier. Um, and that's especially good for sea otters because they we don't want their fur to be matted and have them have heat loss and all that sort of stuff but also it's good for these young harbor seal pups because that open umbilicus is very very susceptible to disease they can go into septic shock very easily so if we're transporting them you know a couple hundred miles from mendocino all the way down to our sausalito office we don't want them laying in their own feces in their own urine um and you know we want to reduce that chance of septic shock so that's what that kind of pvc mat looking thing is on the ground um, we have various sizes of nets that we use. That big one there is a, a per se net that we'll use for larger animals, but we also have kind of smaller salmon nets that you'll see around you know, fishing docks and that kind of stuff. Um, we've used those to fish harbor seal pups out of the water if they seem stranded that way. Um, and then, you know, our, our various vehicles that get us around. We have trucks of various sizes. We have a climate controlled van or two. Uh, there's a boat hiding in the back that we've used in the past. So all these things kind of kind of play a role in how we rescue, but we need to know what to send, right? If, if you send us, you know, hey, a really good description of this little harbor seal pup, we don't need to send the big guns for that. We'll send a little carrier, a, you know, one of these PVC mats and, you know, a guy with a towel just to make sure it's okay. Um, so like I said, we're well equipped for kind of anything and everything, um, but we need to know what to send and, you know, make sure we get it right the first time because we, you know, time is of the essence to get these little guys off the beach. <laughs> So another tool that we like to use and sort of common nomenclature that we have um, is these kind of body condition scorecards that were made up by uh, Shayla Zink. She's actually our operations coordinator down in San Luis Obispo, but she was a, an apprentice here up in Sausalito for a little while. But she came up with these based on how we speak and how the vets speak about the body condition or the, the kind of robustness or healthiness of an animal. Um, and it's a condition score that ranges from one to five, uh, one being absolutely emaciated and five being super fat, overconditioned, obese, which we never see in the wild, um, but we do strive to give get them to a five before we release them because they lose about 20 to 30% of their body weight within a week of being released. Um, so we fatten them up with a lot of herring, get them to a five, send them on their way as fat-free bowling balls. Um, but for this tool especially, you know, you see a, a one here is hips protruding, very pronounced dip between the head and the shoulder area. We kind of use the term peanut head um, just to kind of describe it. Um, very steep angle and sharp angles between all the bones. Um, and very, very emaciated and very kind of loose, flappy skin. A two is uh, similar, but you, there's a little more body conditioning. There might be a little more fat stores under the skin that can, you know, keep the animal a little bit more robust. A three is about where we see most animals in the wild, um, a little bit under conditioned, but that's, you know, life out in the wild is tough, but not too bad. Like this animal we would probably say is, is doing pretty good. And then a four is an absolutely healthy animal that, you know, is right post-release or, you know, doing well, um, really good feeding season, that kind of stuff. So this is the sort of terminology we use in the office. Um, and as Heather is saying in the chat, we have these little flip books that we're going to provide for you guys to go in your field packs that have all this kind of information. So if you call us, you can say, hey, I think this is a body condition score too. And it'll help our responders kind of add a sense of urgency and get a better idea of what these animals are looking like out on the beach. So once we get the animal, what, we, what do we do? We bring it back to the hospital and we treat it. Um, first and foremost, we got to get an admin exam, right? These guys can't talk to us. They can't, you know, the animals can't tell us what's wrong. They can't walk in and say, hey, I have a broken foot or a broken flipper. Um, so we have our trained vets. Uh, here's Dr. Carafield, top of the top there. Um, they give a, all the animals an admin exam, try and figure out what's going on with them. You know, the initial first pass kind of gross what's what's what looks bad on the outside and then we'll do some blood work and all that kind of stuff to, to figure out if there's anything under, underlying um the most common things we see with harbor seals are malnutrition so just 
they're not eating very well for whatever reason and maternal separation um, and that can be caused by a lot of factors uh, human interaction is one of the more common ones um, harbor seals are especially skittish compared to most other animal species that we see in marine mammals um, so if you know you get too close to a harbor seal pup mom will abandon it almost certainly um, so maternal separation caused by human interaction is very common but sometimes we do see young harbor seal mothers just abandon their pups as dr allen was saying before just for resource availability and you know as long as mom can survive and make another pup next year that's better for the population as a whole is how they see it um, and that's a lot of what we do as well is just we want to treat the population not the individual so those are the two most common things but malnutrition and maternal separation but of course there's other stuff such as you know any sorts of disease trauma shark bite predation all that kind of stuff um, so at the hospital here we have an indoor icu hospital by itself um it's separated from our main hospital our harbor seal hospital is top notch and it's you know very we call it the hallowed halls you know we have to have separate slickers separate volunteers you have to sort of do a, a big clean room change to go into it compared to the rest of the hospital because that's just how fragile these guys are and then they have a completely separate set of pools and icu units that have are on a completely different water and filtration system from the main hospital so we take every step possible to make sure these guys are treated as well as possible with how fragile they can be in this in this stage of their life. And then what we do day to day, um, we make sort of a, a fish smoothie, if you will. We blend up some herring with some, you know, other sorts of fats and all this other good stuff. Salmon oil is usually our, our first main source of fat. Um, and then we'll put all of that into a blender, make a big fish smoothie. You can see that this animal here is under restraint and we have kind of a giant bolus syringe and we will actually insert a tube all the way into the animal's stomach and uh, you know, slowly feed that animal that way. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that while this is the best that we can possibly make, this is not as good as mom's milk. So first and foremost, we always want to make sure that we can get to get the animal back to mom first if not we'll try our best um but that's something to always keep in mind too is like we want maternal reconnection versus us treating at the hospital first and foremost um we have very smart people we do our best but still not as good as mom can provide uh, like dr allen said it's you know that that milk that mom has up for 50 percent fat and all of her nutrients and immune response and that kind of stuff and we just can't provide that unfortunately here artificially so we do our best but that's uh, that's what goes into our formulas here um, and then once the animals are starting to get their teeth, they're starting to bite things, um, getting a little more active and plumped up, we'll teach them what we call fish school. Uh, harbor seals, um, unsurprisingly, learn fish school quite a bit faster than elephant seals. Um, if you know anything about elephant seals versus harbor seals, that's not surprising. Um, but what we do basically is we uh, teach them to chase dead fish. Um, and they learn how to you know hunt and swim around and get conditioned in, in the pools um, eventually being able to do what we call free feeding so we'll take a big bucket of herring we'll throw it into a pool full of harbor seals they'll all go for it and feed as much as they can um, and they'll sort of get that that prey drive and that prey response um, to learn to eat fish on their own and then also another thing we've been doing in more recent years um, we've had a, a couple studies going on um, is we're providing enrichment for our patients. We found that there's actually a, a higher sort of incidence of uh, successful rehabilitation with um, engage and um, excuse me enrichment. Um, and what that can look like is you know like some fake sea kelp here, which we use uh, car car wash sort of what do you call those tendrils, I guess, on buoys. Um, we have sort of fish boxes that we've tried making where we put, you know, a, a fish in a, a puzzle box and they try and work it out kind of thing. Um, but it just provides, you know, enrichment and engagement for these animals to kind of improve their, their cognitive abilities out in the wild, as well as just improve their time in captivity with us because you know animals do have sort of captivity ailments. Um, so that's that's made to deter that and, and provide them with better enrichment. <laughs> So Nomi specifically here, uh, what happens at the end of all this treatment, right? So Nomi got a nice hat tag for easy identification because if you're in a pool and there's five harbor seals floating in a pool all bobbing up and down, yeah, they have very distinct spot patterns, but if they're bobbing up and down, it's very hard to tell who's who. So we'll take a, uh, a wooden or a biodegradable hat tag, stick it on there, 
um, with some biodegradable glue, it falls off after a week. We've actually found <laughs> some of those hat tags on the beach before, just without the animal. Um, so those stay on for you know about a week or so after after release, but that's helped us identify these animals. Um, they're paired with animals of similar size and age class, so they can learn to be social. We don't want antisocial harbor seals out in the wild. Um, and they learn to compete and they learn to socialize and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it just, again, it provides them better enrichment in captivity. Um, and we can sort of get them as cohorts going through the process. And then after about two and a half months of treatment, we take them out to the beach in a big group and release them all. Uh, it's graduation day and they all flood out onto the beaches. And it's a lot easier to release animals, you know, in, in multiples. They all tend to say, hey, the ocean's this way together versus one is like, well, I want to go back in the cage and hang out with my friends back at school. So like, let's let's stay here. Uh, so we try and release some big groups like this. Um, and that way, you know, they all kind of graduate together. <laughs> And Justin, before we switch gears off of Nomi's story um, to mm -hmm. a different harbor seal, there there was at least one good question that um, kind of came up related to kind of lack of cell phone reception um, on some of these places. What are some of the ways that you and the dispatch team would hope to have that communication? What do you recommend for folks that might see animals out on the beach? Yeah, so that is a very common thing that we run into. Um, and there are various ways that we tackle this. Um, this is why we send kind of an assessor first. Uh, we may ask you as a person on the beach to relay information to a TMMC person that comes out. Uh, we may ask that you send someone to a place that has better cell reception. Um, we may just get as good of a a uh, description of the animal as possible and send a team knowing from the dispatch office that a rescue needs to happen. Uh, we don't always need to send a responder to look at the animal physically and say yes, or, you know, and then get approval from the dispatch team. We have a collaborative process within dispatch with our responders that, hey, we trust your judgment on the beach, you trust our judgment in the office, we'll work together the best solution. Um, so we may send a responder out just like, what based on what we've heard, just go get that animal. We know there's no cell reception. We don't want you hiking back and forth five miles to get this animal, you know, to tell us that, yes, you think it should be rescued. We can kind of determine that uh, based on the information that we get. Um, but we also have a texting line uh, in addition to our, our regular hotline, um, and we can provide that as well. Um, it's a Google Voice texting line, so you can shoot a text message off. We also have our email address, rescue at tmmc.org. You can email reports in. Um, so any mode of uh, digital communication that you have, we have as well, um, sort of sending up smoke signals, which you know I, I don't think we can do on the beach. Um, but yeah, I think there's, you know, whatever you can figure out. And like I said, we can provide that texting line. Um, you may get a bounce back saying, hey, we, we prefer you guys to call in. Um, that's just sort of a general how we say, you know, we want to get your 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 audio report or your, you know, your voice report. Um, but if you say, hey, I have poor cell reception, but I see this harbor seal on the beach, do you mind sending somebody out? That's enough to get us rolling, right? Um, and we'll send those, those responders out. Excellent. Thanks, Justin. Mm -hmm. um, Kind of switching gears a little bit, we want to highlight a couple different stories, each kind of highlighting the different threats and process for these animals. So you had Nomi out on the beach, kind of very, very young, obviously, all by itself, and you saw the press process. We also saw Fry, this harbor seal, similar beach, different kind of timing, though, um, about the same size, and something was was clearly off. We got reports from people on the beach identifying that there was this really small animal all by itself, no mom around. Um, but there was kind of a reason we kind of figured out why it was all by itself and why it was alone. And it turns out that not surprisingly, people find harbor seals to be ridiculously adorable. Um, this little five to six day old as we aged it, um, was found by some people out on the beach and looked alone and looked like maybe it was in trouble. And what they wound up doing is they actually picked the animal up off the beach um, and they moved it all the way across the beach. They were very concerned that this is an animal all by itself. It can't swim. It's going to get washed out by these storms. Um, so they picked it up and moved it um, around 100 yards or so away. Um, not great. Let's just be honest. Good intentions, not what we hope to see. Um, the thing with harbor seals, and, and Dr. Allen talked a little bit about this, and you're probably familiar as well, is that they're born out on the beach, and they're going to spend one month with mom. They can swim on their own, so they do have that ability. Mom's also going to leave them on the beach on occasion to go out and find food. 
Um, she can't just fast for 30 days. Mom's typically within eyesight though. So just offshore, finding food, looking at the pup. And what happens is people see this baby on the beach all by itself. Oh my God, it's abandoned. I need to help it. And as they approach it, what happens is the mom actually sees this and says, oh, this is way too dangerous. I can't come back now. And it's actually the person going to try and help the animal. That's the reason it's become abandoned in the first place. So well-intentioned, but clearly this was an action that resulted in the harbor seal becoming abandoned and needing help. Luckily, we found out we were able to get out there, rescue Fry, bring Fry back to the hospital and start that process that you heard with Nomi. But unfortunately, this is something we see all too common. Over just the last year in 2022, up and down our California coast, we had over 150 cases of direct human interaction. So people touching these animals, petting these animals, moving these animals, or having dogs off leash very close to these animals resulting in stress and harm. So this is a major reason we see animals needing our help, but also a great opportunity that if we can get the right messages out there, because people want to help these animals, we can drastically reduce the number of animals needing rescue each and every year. Justin, do you want to talk through the process um, a little bit here? What, what is your criteria when we're kind of figuring out when that animal needs to be picked up? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as Adam said, we uh, we here in the office, in the dispatch office, we sort of go through, uh, we don't want to, just, want to just grab every animal off the beach that may or may not be sick and just hope for the best, right? That's that's bad for the animal. That's bad for the population. That's bad for us at the hospital. You know, it puts a lot of strain and effort on us. It's, you know, resource heavy. Um, so we sort of go through a, a baseline of questions that we ask ourselves or ask each other, um, you know, first and foremost is, is the animal able to recover on its own? And this applies to every different sorts of concerns that animals can have, right? Where if you see a, a very injured, grievously wounded sea lion on the beach that got attacked by a shark, right? Are the injuries in consistent with something that is going to, you know, basically kill it? Or is it something that is looks bad, but it can heal from, you know, marine mammals have amazing healing capabilities. Um, with harbor seals specifically, is is this animal able to recover its own? Is it a, a relatively healthy pup that looks like it maybe just got placed there by mom recently? Um, or is it kind of getting thinner um, and showing signs that maybe it hasn't fed in a while? Because these animals, you know, like most babies, they, they plump up and skinny down pretty quickly. You know, as they feed, they get sort of balloon shaped and then they'll start to deflate after a day or two. Then they'll pump back up as they eat, right? So we can determine even just based on photos, like relatively when the last time the animal ate. So is the animal okay and able to recover on its own. Another thing we want to take into account is safety for our responders as well as the animal. Is the environment safe for both the animal and the rescuers? And that can be a multitude of things. Is it safe because of you know, the terrain for the responders to get down to? Is it just an absolutely insane hike down a cliff? Are the rocks really slippery? Is the tide coming in? Um, is it safe for our rescuers to be able to get down there and get the animal because you know our 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 motto is do no harm and that that encompasses humans and animals right um and then also is it safe for the animal you know if if we're going to rescue a harbor seal pup or a sea lion and it's kind of perched on a rock is netting that animal or going to grab that animal going to cause the animal to flush into the water and cause problems or is it a pup that's within a rookery and yes maybe the pup is abandoned we determine that it's abandoned but it's in a rookery with 10 or 15 other mom pup pairs. And if we go get that one pup, are we going to flush all the other ones? That's going to, you know, cause pro problems for the, the population as a whole, right? So we have to take that into account of, is it going to be good for the population or just good for one animal? Because if we scare 15 other moms off, then we have 16 animals we have to rescue and rehabilitate when we could have just, you know, had one, right? And then is reuniting mom and pup feasible? So the way we sort of do that without touching it is we have a general sort of guideline that we use within TMMC of if the animals, we can determine if the animal is less than a week old, and again, based on that lanugo coat, that umbilicus freshness, juiciness, um, a couple other factors. We monitor it for a couple hours. We'll sit back on the beach, you know, 100 yards away with binoculars, scanning the water, scanning the pup, keeping people away, seeing if, you know, and this has happened quite frequently. We'll, we'll see a harbor seal mom head pop up in the water and look directly at us and then 
pop back down they pop up 10 yards closer and then you know we see that fairly frequently like yes mom is around mom is watching us the best thing we can do is keep people away if the animal appears to be older than a week um you know that umbilicus is gone or very kind of jerky texture and you know that lanugo coat is shed and it's looking like a kind of a healthier more robust pup we usually like to keep them on watch for 24 to 48 hours um and as the as these pups get older outside that first week mom will leave them for longer and longer stints right so they may be on the beach for 12 hours and mom checks on them every couple hours or you know more um so we just want to give them that time and that space and that availability for mom to do her job properly and what we do and what you guys can do as well is educating the public keeping them back all that kind of stuff and just let the mom and the pup do their thing um and it's easier said than done from personal experience you know they are very cute and uh, you, you are very concerned it's very hard to tell 10 people they're also as concerned as you that it's okay mom's right out there i swear um but that's that's the best thing is for this animal to reunite with uh with mom so that's sort of the process we go through um and then you know, obviously, is there going to be a, a sort of outside interaction, right? Would there, would another animal, would, it, would a predator be going to attack it? Are there dogs on the beach that, you know, off-leash dogs or on-leash dogs that are, you know, under, not under control anymore that are going to affect this animal? Um, and, you know, what, what do we want to do here? And like I said before, also, we want to make sure that we're not going to harm any other animals in the process. We don't want to go and flush a whole population out or a rookery out because we think one pup may or may not be abandoned, or we did determine it's abandoned. We, you know, we don't want to flush that whole population. Um, so there, there's methods for that too. And that's, that's one of the harder recalls that we get is that we'll see a pup in a rookery that is clearly abandoned, but it's surrounded by animals. But as you know, Dr. Allen talked about, and we've talked about these animals will take their pups out to feed. These animals will take their pups out for a swim. So it may present an opportunity for us to rescue that pup. Eventually we just need to have that sense of calm and that sense of patience to find the time to get the animal instead of rushing out and saving it. Like, yes, they're fragile animals, but again, we got to keep in mind the population as a whole and not just the individual. And that's tough to say and tough to see. So again, here we see, uh, see Fry after two months of treatment, fat and happy, we took her, took him out to Chimney Rock here with a, another cohort to, to be released. Um, you can see a pretty stark difference of that kind of body condition score one to two there, and then the, the body condition score five. Um, and again, that's just two months of ground up herring and uh, you know, chopped up herring. Um, yeah, this, this is the, the success story that we like. Again, the first success story is if, they can, if we know that mom's going to take care of them. The second success story is getting these animals out happy and healthy. So the best thing you guys can do um, if you see any marine mammal on the beach, but especially harbor seals, is stay at least 50 feet away. Um, you know, I, we say 50, I always recommend 100. Um, keep all dogs on leashes, tell everyone to keep their dog on a leash. Um, and that one is a very hard sticking point for a lot of people, especially in the, the area that you guys are responding to, right? Where, oh, this is an off-leash dog beach. It's not, um, but uh, colloquially it is, it's an off-leash dog beach. Um, and we wanna keep in mind that we're not trying to combat bad behavior, we're trying to engage and, you know, build up another set of stewards, right? So that can be via people that have their dogs off leash and, you know, always assume, you know, that they don't have bad intentions. They don't, they don't want to harm these animals. They don't want to just look out for themselves. They just, they just may be unaware of what can happen, right? Um, and then number three is to call us if you think an animal needs help. And again, that hotline is 415-289-SEAL. And another thing to keep in mind that I always like to point out is that the Marine Mammal Center is not an enforcement agency. We're here to rescue and rehabilitate animals. We are not here to come write tickets and police, you know, bad behavior in any way. So if you do see something that is illegal or something that is bad, like a marine mammal is being harmed in some way, that is an enforcement problem and there's a different number for that you can call us and we'll forward that report along obviously but just so you know that's that's where our jurisdiction sort of ends and we don't want to put our responders in an unsafe position either by sending them into a potentially bad scenario so keep that in mind when you call hey i see some sort of bad behavior happening you know, a harbor seal pup is being attacked by a dog we can't go out there and prevent that from happening we can rescue the animal and try and treat it but we're not going to be the ones that go out and prevent it, if that makes sense. So I want to make that clear distinction for people that, yes, you can call us with something bad happening. We'll call the appropriate authorities, but we're not the policing agency. 
And then we've got one more story and then we'll kind of open it up for, for some questions, but wanted to tell a little bit of a different story, same location, obviously. So a couple different animals from Goat Rock Beach. This is not necessarily a young pup. This is an animal that got all the time it needed with, with mom. It was very obvious just based off the size of this animal. And obviously we can, because harbor seal breeding is so predictable in the sense of they are born in the spring, we're able to kind of age animals pretty well as we get into the summer, into the fall, into the winter. And this was a group that saw an animal out on the beach and immediately knew, oh my God, something is wrong. This animal is dying. It needs help. Um, for better or for worse, that was more or less the message we got over the phone. Um, and we got some pictures and it was clear this animal had some pretty big gashes along its back and back flippers. Um, as we zoom in, uh, I've tried to make things not particularly gory, but I do want to just acknowledge that some of these can be hard to see um, because we love these animals. We care about these animals. We don't want to see them hurt. So we saw these animals or we got out there, we evaluated these lacerations and they were pretty deep cuts. Um, at which point we realized this is an animal that's going to need rescue. It might be hard to believe, but for some of these animals, even though they've got big gashes or trauma, one of the best treatments for that is actually salt water. Um, the animals are incredibly resilient, have the ability to heal themselves. So there are times where we'll go out there, evaluate the animal and realize you know, best thing is actually to let this animal try and heal on its own. It doesn't need surgery. It might not need antibiotics. Um, it just needs a peaceful place to rest without causing the extra stress of transporting it. In this particular case, though, it was right across that line. And we realized this is an animal that could benefit from additional support. Bringing the animal back to the hospital, we uh, were able to sedate it, kind of get a close look, and we identified these were almost definitely shark bite wounds. Um, you heard from, from Dr. Allen, there are really only two major predators. You've got great white sharks and you've got orcas. Um, to be really honest, orcas don't leave a trace, um, so we were pretty sure this was a shark. Um, we also can actually analyze, identify the species of shark, looking at where are the tooth patterns. This can be a, a source of data as we look to threats. What we were able to do is provide some antibiotics. We want to make sure that there wasn't infection involved. Um, we can use any of the various medications you might get for a big traumatic injury. We've actually used honey before, which is a natural um, product that allows to treat um, some of these things. And really what the animal needed after the antibiotics, just a little bit of cleaning, is it just needed a place to rest and relax and heal. Um, and of course, we needed to plump Naya up at the same time. Um, and with this, put it with other animals, gave it that enrichment, did all the things you've heard so far, um, and really a pretty remarkable recovery. Um, keeping in mind, this is four weeks um, and this didn't involve surgery. We didn't suture these wounds closed. And you can see how quickly that animal healed up. Um, so it really is a testament to how resilient these animals are out on the beach. Um, and part of that decision-making process, you heard from Justin of when we have to, to decide what's best for the animal here. Is best being out on the beach and giving it the chance to have that natural opportunity, whether that's reuniting with mom, or healing on its own, or when is human intervention necessary? And it can be a tough conversation to have with yourself. It can be a tough conversation to have with guests. So we acknowledge that. We hope to be a support system for you in that as well. And I just encourage you always to remember that we all have the same interest in mind. We all want to help that animal. Um, and we've been able to build these criteria and kind of guidance documents on around 45 years worth of experience seeing where is that line for when the animal might be able to do best on its own first being rescued? So with all of that being said, what are the key messages that we hope that you walk away with and that you share with all of the people you're going to have a chance to talk with out on the beaches? You, you heard Justin talk a little bit about this. Distance and providing that safe space is going to be key. Um, at least 50 feet 
um, and trying to make sure that the dogs are on leash. We have found for the most part that when you talk to folks um, around the dog stuff, being able to lead with actually what might be best for the dog is actually a really helpful approach here um, because no one wants their dog to wind up getting sick. Um, so we've used this tagline, safe dog, safe seal before, um, trying to minimize any potential for disease transmission, for biting on either end of the spectrum, because these are wild animals. They do have teeth um, for the most part, for any of those that are just over a few days old. Um, so let's try and make sure everyone stays safe. Um, an easy rule of thumb to know if you are too close as well is, is the animal acknowledging your presence? Is it looking at you? Did it lift its head? Is it reacting to noise? Trying to make sure that we're providing as much space as possible. Um, staying calm and easier said than done. I fully acknowledge that both Jess and I have been out on the beaches doing these rescues. I've done some in Sonoma County um, and it is a high stress time and people can be, um, what's the appropriate way to say this, less than cooperative. Um, remembering we are able to do a lot for these animals. We can't ticket people. We can't force someone to put a dog on a leash. We can't force someone actually to put the seal down if they are holding it and rocking it like a baby. Um, this is where you can really utilize your resources with state parks. Um, and make sure that they are um, kind of in the know. And we are, of course, able to be allies in that as well. I will just say that the best approach for a lot of these things is people tend to mirror bad behavior um, and tone. So if we're being really aggressive, if we're being really kind of, you have to do that, you're killing the animal, people tend to actually dig in their heels a little bit more. So being able to try and, Keep that sense of calm, take that deep breath, thinking about what tone we're using, how we're approaching it, coming from a place of shared value. I think the reason why people are close to this animal, they're holding it, they're hugging it, trying to rock it, is because they want to help it. Um, let's start there and try and pivot them to a behavior that is actually helpful. And of course, call us, be our eyes and ears, and let us know when you see an animal that's out there. Um, the last two things that I would simply share, and um, we acknowledge it is tough for you as our eyes and ears, there will most likely be times where you see an animal that's out there and you think it is dying and needs to be rescued within a few minutes, um, and we might not share that opinion. Um, Again, I hope that you understand that we're coming from the same place um, and we're trying to use our 45 years of experience here. Um, keep the lines of communication open, um, but know that we're working towards the same thing for you. We might just have different information or different history to help us guide in what's the best course of action there, whether it's for the animal or maybe it's the need to protect people. Um, because as you notice, it requires a lot of equipment um, it's not just how do we get the animal, it's how do we get the animal out as well that we need to keep in mind. Um, and then last but not least, and probably the reason why you're in this training and you're volunteering your time is just the opportunity to connect people with these animals. We are so lucky here in California and along the Sonoma coast in particular to be able to see these animals up close, to have not only harbor seals, but sea lions and elephant seals and whales and dolphins just right off our coast and being able to share some of the history, some of the amazing attributes, things that you heard from Dr. Allen earlier. Um, and then hopefully being able to get some of these steps into the conversations of ways that people can help, whether it's along the beaches and keeping the distance and calling us, or it's some of those bigger global threats that we know are affecting animals, ways that they might be able to reduce their plastic pollution, maybe buying sustainably sourced seafood or reducing their carbon footprint as ways that we can create that healthy ocean for marine mammals and people alike. And the Marine Mammal Center has a plethora of resources if you're interested in things on climate change or overfishing or ocean trash that we can help provide you. Or as we've been talking with Heather um, leading up to this, future trainings um, and webinars and resources that we can do for your cohort of volunteers. So consider us an asset and a resource both now and into the future and don't hesitate to reach out if there are things we can do to help support your work. So with that being said, uh, 
put up a couple last photos of what appears to be an elephant seal raising its hand like it has a question and a harbor seal just shouting at us. Um, and we'll turn it over to questions. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing just so it's a little bit easier um, to see. I've seen lots of things coming through the chat. Um, Justin, I think you've had a little bit of a better eye on it if there's anything that we want to start addressing first. Otherwise, we can kind of open it up and have people come off mute. Yeah, I think the, the major shift I'm seeing is calm stuff, which Heather, I think you're going you're gonna to talk about um, a little bit more. Um, uh, just to answer the question that I saw come through the chat, yes, we work with state parks very closely, but I don't want to step on Heather and say that, like, yes, call state parks because I, you guys have your own protocols for communication if you don't have any cell reception. Um, and then to answer Linda's last question about volunteers, yes, we typically send out a newbie volunteer with a experienced volunteer, or at the very least, sort of have them have limited duties where, like, yes, they can do an assessment, but they may not do a rescue, or we may get an experienced volunteer out there to sort of help guide what they're seeing. Um, so it's not just a brand new person going out and saying, no, he's fine. We don't need to rescue him. Um, so yeah, but I think that covered a lot of what we're seeing. Perfect. Uh, um, yeah, any other open questions? Yeah, please feel free to use the chat box or if you want to come off mute, we're happy to address things. I think we've got a little bit under 10 minutes. I have a, a question or maybe a request. So we are... Some of us are experienced SEAL Watch volunteers. Some of us are new and interested and haven't been out on the beach yet. So maybe you can talk a little bit more about behind the scenes um, and your communications internally when you get that dispatch call, um, how that, what, what factors are considered be, uh, in making the decision to whether you're going to rescue that animal or not. I know you talked a lot about that, um, but can you go a little bit more into detail so that we understand when we, after we make a call, what's happening behind the scenes? Who's talking to who? Who's heading out to the beach? How much time does that involve? Just so that we have a, a, a better understanding of what's happening on your end. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, we get that call, you know, we take all the information that I talked about, you know, everything that we need to know and, you know, with those body condition scorecards that goes a long way, um, as well as all the identifiers that we'll see on a harbor seal pup specifically, but other animals. Um, and then we'll usually consult with the vet staff. Uh, we have, they're on site all the time treating the animals that are here on site. We have a radio, we'll radio them and say, hey, we have X, Y, Z going on. Um, this animal looks like it needs pickup. Can we get a second opinion? So that, you know, that takes a few minutes and that also bolsters our confidence in whether or not an animal needs to be picked up. So a trained professional vet, based on photos, based on description, will give a quick, not diagnosis, but sort of prognosis of what's going on with that animal. Um, again, we don't we don't like to diagnose on the beach. Our responders that go out are usually not veterinarians or vet techs. Um, if there's something grossly wrong, obviously they'll say like, yes, there's a trauma of some kind, but we can't really diagnose on the beach. But based on all the information we're gathering, we say, hey, this looks like a candidate for pickup. We get backing from the professionals, the you know the, the vets with all the letters after their names. Um, and then we decide, yes, it's time to roll. And then depending on where the animal is, what resources resources we have available, who is on site. Um, our volunteers can do a, a sort of plethora of duties, right? They can be what we call on call, which means, hey, my phone's on, I'm available for the next six hours. Something comes into my area, give me a call, I'll go from home. Um, we also have volunteers that come on site. So they'll be doing duties around the house kind of thing, doing chores around the house, um, cleaning trucks, mending equipment, and they're ready to go take a truck and gear to wherever they need to go. Um, so sort of depending on what availability we have that day, um, we'll be able to dispatch a little bit quicker or what we kind of default to if we don't have anyone readily available is we use a, a program called GroupMe, which means that we'll send out just sort of a big blast to anybody in Sonoma or anybody in San Mateo and whoever can pick up the phone and be available for two hours that day will call in and say, hey, what do you need me to do? And I'll go do it. So all these steps in the process do take time. You know, it could be five minutes. It could be an hour and a half, depending on Again, human availability, resource availability. Um, this also ties into, you know, during puppy season, we have 
30 plus responses happening in our 600 miles of coastline and we have seven dispatchers sitting in the dispatch office trying to man all these responses um so that's another consideration that we have of hey i've been out here for two hours you guys said you're sending somebody it's like well these are there's three other responses happening sort of in your area or adjacent to your area so we'll get there when we get there we deprioritize this animal comparatively it's still a priority but comparatively it's deprioritized like and that should give you also a sense of confidence that we sort of determine that the animal's not in any immediate danger. So it's probably okay to just continue doing what you're doing and keeping people away and, you know, engaging them, educating them, that sort of thing. Um, it's sort of like a, a waiting room of a hospital, right? The guy with the broken leg that walks in is probably going to get treated before the guy with the stuffy nose, right? Um, the guy with the gunshot wound is going to get treated before the guy with the broken leg. So keep that in mind also. That's how we try to triage stuff. Uh, if you don't see a sense of immediacy from us, it's not that we don't care. We're not trying. It's that there's probably something higher up on the priority list. Um, but we will get there eventually. So keeping all that in mind of just, you know, got to get check in from the vet, got to check our resources and got to see what else is going on in our, in that area. Right. Cause like, you know, like we talked about there's 600 miles of coastline to cover and we've only got so many people and so many volunteers. Thank you, Justin. That really helps put, uh, all of it in context. Thank you. Yeah, of course. We have about four minutes. Um, please speak. We have our experts here. Please feel free to, to ask your questions. You don't have to put them in chat. Well, I see one from Lorena. Lorena, do you want to come off mute and say it or do you want me to read the question aloud? I'm happy to do either. Hi. Hi. Hello. Um, yeah, uh, just the changes in the shorelines during the really severe storms, like the El Nino storms that took out the beach and took out the houses and all the stuff that falls into the sea. Those really severe storms are like the recent storms, Goat Rock Beach didn't exist for a while. The sea and the river just kind of met and eliminated the beach. Um, so do the seals just instinctively go to deeper waters for protection and if those storms are happening during pupping seasons and stuff, where do they rest? How do they handle it in those storms? It is a great question. Um, and it really varies. There's not a, a solid answer because every harbor seal behaves differently. They've got different personalities. They've got different risk management. It's going to depend on age and experience. Um, there's, to be honest, a little bit more data on elephant seals in this realm than there is harbor seals. So I can speak a little bit to that just very recently. If you think about Point Reyes, uh, one of the large rookeries for elephant seals, you've got elephant seals that are on the bay side and you've got animals that are on the ocean side. Um, mm -hmm. And we've seen them actually shifting and moving um, and they populate the beaches that are more protected from those big storms, particularly during El Nino years and things like that as the shorelines have been shrinking, um, we've lost oh, around yeah. eight inches of, of coastline um, due to sea level rise in California, which might not seem like a lot, but is pretty drastic. Um, this means there's less space for them. Um, and for the elephant seals, um, sometimes there aren't a lot of places you can go to. Um, so we do see animals get washed out um, and there is mortality from this. Um, the elephant seals aren't able to swim at birth, um, so they're at higher risk than some of the harbor seals. But certainly we would assume the harbor seals, while they can swim, might not be the greatest swimmers. Um, and, and big storms can impact them, and losing some of these breeding grounds is definitely a major cause con for concern. It's why climate change is one of the key things the Marine Mammal Center mm -hmm. is working to address, um, and why I encouraged you if you've got the opportunity with these really passionate people out on the beaches, let's take the conversation to the next level beyond just, hey, like, don't touch it. Um, it's, hey, like, you're, you're visiting from Iowa. You're visiting from Maryland. What are ways that they can help protect the ocean and climate change, for better or for worse, affects everything? Um, and it means that there are things we can do about it as well. Um, I will say that we have seen with harbor seals, they're pretty resilient in, in a sense. So you might see them on some of these rock outcroppings or getting a little bit higher up. I still can't believe with their short little weird flippers that they can get as far <laughs> up on rocks as they do. 
but they're pretty agile. Um, and then finding some of these inlets and things that might be protected from the wind and those extra big waves. So they're doing the best they can. And I think for us with climate change, it's at a certain point, that's not going to be enough if we don't give them more time to adapt and why we need to take action now. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, because it's really noticeable that their environments change with these storms. So thank you. So we are at time. And uh, I want to thank Adam and Justin. You guys are amazing. Um, really appreciate being available on a Saturday morning. <laughs> um, I really can't thank you enough. And uh, the Marine Mammal Center, we are just so fortunate to have you in our backyard, so to speak. Um, we're going to, at the end of the presentation, there is a link to the Marine Mammal Center. I encourage you to visit their website. There's uh, some great educational resources on there. We focus so far mostly on harbor seals. You've noticed that as a theme through this presentation. And that's because that is the marine mammal that we're most likely going to observe at Goat Rock Beach at the mouth of the Russian River. So we really wanted to spend this time with you today focused on harbor seals because this is seal watch and you are most likely going to be watching the harbor seals. Um, that being said, we have California sea lions that will pop up in the surf. Uh, you'll know them because they make their presence known. They're a little boisterous and um, they're always fun to see bobbing up in the surf. Um, so I encourage you to visit the Marine Mammal Center. I encourage you to look more into the pinnipeds, other pinnipeds that Dr. Sarah Allen also reviewed. Um, you can deep dive into more information <laughs> um, and you can get lost in Google rabbit holes, um, but there's gonna be a lot of links at the end of the presentation in, in our PDF that we'll share. Um, so we're going to do, so thank you very much, Adam and um, Justin, I welcome you to, to stay for the remainder of the presentation, but if, if you cannot, I understand we've already taken a lot of your time, but we're going to get in, when we come back from our next 10 minute break, We'll go into the SEAL Watch program. We're gonna have a little bit of a, of a um, introduction to climate science and stewards of the coast and redwoods with Kathy Johnson, one of our uh, board of directors. She's going to uh, start the next segment after this 10 minute break. So we'll get into SEAL Watch, we'll dive in deep, we'll talk about logistics. Some of you already brought up some really good questions that we'll address in that segment. Um, We'll cover onboarding, we'll cover talking with folks about um, dogs on the beach, how best to approach the public, uh, and really art of interpretation. Yeah. We're there to guide interpretation of the harbor seals and their ecosystem. So there's a lot to come. Uh, take a 10 minute break, stretch your legs, get some lunch if you can real quick. And I'll see you back here at 1138. Thank you folks we can get so that we can get Kathy teed up. We've got another minute or so before we want to start, give people some time to come back. Um, once I share my screen and go into my slideshow, I'm not going to be able to view comments. So Justin, would you please monitor for questions? Absolutely. And um, uh, we'll have time at the end for another discussion, but feel free to, I'll ask if we have questions before I move on to next slide. So that might help with timing. So I'm gonna share my screen now and please uh, welcome Kathy. Hi everyone. So do you want me to just dive in, Heather? Uh, Kathy, yes, I'll introduce you. Kathy is okay. our, <laughs> I'm getting caught up with all these multiple screens. Give me one. Have I shared my screen? No, I have not. <laughs> all right, here we go. Now you should be able to see it. All right. So Kathy is our, uh, one of our board of directors and she is the, um, instructor for the Climate Stewards course that's offered through the University of California 
Um, keep your eye out for that if you're interested in learning about how to communicate about client science. Um, it'll be coming up onto the website um, hopefully in the next uh, in a short in the short um, future. And Kathy, please um, tell us a little bit more about yourself and climate science in the stewards course. Um, thanks, Heather. So hi, everyone. Um, I'm Kathy Johnson. And like Heather mentioned, I'm on the board of directors and I lead the climate initiatives for Stewards of the Coast and Redwoods. And I'm the instructor for UC Climate Stewards, which is a course offered out of with UC a &R, which is University of California Agricultural Natural Resources. It's um, it's the sister class related class to the California Naturalist course. And just a just a just a second about me. So I have been a wildlife professional and risk communicator for over 20 years with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And, um, and I started teaching the UC Climate course. Last year was the first year. And what the course is about is about communication. And so what I want to do is just take a couple of minutes and just give you guys some tools. So when you're out there and you start talking about climate change or climate anything, a lot of people can become very uncomfortable with it. And um, hopefully after this, after this, You'll have some tips. There's some resources that Heather's going to share with you that will maybe take away that discomfort. And if you're not, if you're not, if you're totally comfortable with it, even better. But out there when you're doing the volunteering, um, it'd be nice if we can kind of keep it, you know, keep it kind of packaged, um, following what the Stewards of the Coast and Redwoods messaging is going to be. And um, hopefully soon we are going to have the everything I'm talking about is going to be in the docents manuals. They're going to be coming out, so there's going to be some consistent messaging. So you're not just out there dangling on your own and trying to figure out what it is you want to say if you already don't have, you know, um, your ideas and things that you want to share. And one of the first things is that when you're out there talking about climate and the seals and storms is to make sure you know the difference between climate and weather. And I know that sounds very simple, but they're, they're very different. You know, weather is, is short term and what happens, it's an atmospheric event that happens in, a, in, a, in an area or throughout an area. And climate is weather that is specific to a region over a long period of time. And then of course, climate change refers to any long-term changes. So, you know, so when we talk about these past storms, that was weather, but were those weather, was that weather triggered by climate? Which most likely it was, and but we're not gonna get into too much of that right now. Um, so. Um, when you're out there talking about climate, somebody asks you about climate change, just in general, mostly they're going to ask you how the seals are going to be affected. Um, but if somebody starts engaging with climate change um, conversations, make sure that you keep it to a local scale. Talk about it, how it's affecting our area or maybe the California coast in general. Try not to um, pull out like the, the sound bites about like ice melting, which is important. Don't get me wrong. That's very important on a large global climate scale conversation. But when we're talking about seal watch and we're talking about the Sonoma Coast, try to keep it local. And then that'll also keep, keep it to your story, which is very important when you're talking about climate is you don't necessarily want to get like, you know, super emotional about it, but everybody just wants to hear everybody else's story. So when people start talking about climate change, you can see how it affects you, how it affects the seals, what you're seeing out there on the beaches. Like I think um, somebody just mentioned earlier, you know how some of the beaches like Blank, um, Go Rock Beach was, was missing during the big storms because it just became part of the river mouth. So those, those are conversations you can have and keep that very local, even though you have people coming in from out of state. Um, and then also, so when you're talking about climate change, everybody wants to jump off into like scientific talk. And that's, um, that's great if you're a climate scientist and you really understand the data. There's a lot of misinformation out there. And we want to make sure that you don't, that nobody's saying anything that's triggering. And um, quite honestly, my personal opinion as a scientist is we don't need any more data points. We need to have conversations and we need to be understanding and compassionate to everybody. And that's how, that's how we're going to get through the crisis of climate change is being able to relate to people. And you can't really do that if you're, if you're, um, if you're pulling um, scientific information that maybe you don't understand really well. Um, and then also um, one of the issues with climate communication, and we go over this in the climate um, stewards course, is um, being mindful of how you talk with people and how you receive what they're saying. Um, it can become very emotional and it can be very triggering. So um, when you're talking, 
So I apologize. I'm getting messages that my mic that I'm going in and out. I have um I have my mic on full. So I will hey, kind of Kathy, I, th I think if you um just speak directly at your mic or your video thing, um, it's like when you're moving around a little bit that it's fading in and out. Oh, okay. My Worth apologies. a try. My it doesn't it doesn't happen on my team's call. It only seems to happen for Zoom. So um I only get this uh, complaint when I'm on Zoom. Um, so just be so just be mindful when you're talking to people out there, and um, and just know that everybody has it's because climate change really triggers up a, a fear base, and nothing really comes out. No good decisions are made through fear, and so just be mindful of statements and like comments that you make, um, and and also protect yourself so you're not getting really judgmental comments to yourself, and then also know when to walk away. And I don't think you're gonna, I don't know if you'll experience this, people who go out to, to look at the seals, I don't know if you'll experience that, but know when a conversation is not worth it and then maybe to end, end it and change it, like jump into a different conversation. And like Heather mentioned, I'm going to um, just kind of close it up with this, is we have the UC Climate Stewards course coming up in August. Um, my information I do believe is on the slide that you're looking at, um, that everybody's seeing. Feel free to drop me a line if you have any questions about climate communication, um, ways to phrase things, and if you're interested in taking the climate communication or the climate steward course, which um, will be helpful, which is very helpful for climate communication. And then also look for the updated docent manual because it'll have climate change information, um, communication, um, and tips on what to say, some maybe some canned language to practice with as well. So, anyhow, like I said, that my email's at the bottom of the slide. Get a hold of me if you need to, or you have any questions or comments. And thanks for your time. Thanks, Heather, for letting me jump on your training. Thank you, Kathy. That was such important and very useful information because we do get questions about climate science from folks that are concerned about its impact on the seals and the larger environment in that area. So. Um, I encourage everybody to contact Kathy to, um, to pursue the Climate Stewards course. And then in this field binder that you'll have out on site with you, we'll have also some talking points and some guidance on how to have um, conversations that can be a little challenging. So you will get some additional support. And uh, are there any questions in the chat about that? segment of our talk or or should I transition over to seal watch no there's no questions I don't see any questions just all the comments are about my sound <laughs> so okay oh wait never mind all right so thank you for every everyone we're in our third segment you are troopers. You've been with us since 9 a.m. I hope the 10 minute breaks helped break up the um, timing and allowed some of this information to settle. And, and um, again, this is not gonna be the last you hear on any of these topics. We'll be, um, we have other trainings offered through stewards. There's resources that will be provided to you, and there's always the phone. So do not feel that you have to absorb all of this by the uh, by 12:30 and be ready to go and be the seal watch expert. This is all just surface, get you started, get you uh, oriented. So we talked about the natural history of the seals. We learned a little bit about their behavior, their physiology, their reproduction. We learned about rescue and response and rehabilitation of, of harbor seals, specifically those from the Russian River mouth or the confluence of the Russian River and the Pacific Ocean. So let's look at what you will experience and what you will observe should you sign up for a seal watch shift. And we certainly hope you do. Um, I'm gonna show you a video. And I have to tell you, when I first learned about seal watch, I had no idea there were seals at the mouth of the Russian river. I was somewhat new to Sonoma County and uh, had never walked 
north on Goat Rock Beach to the mouth of the river. So when I heard that there were seals within viewing distance, I was ecstatic. So imagine my delight when I headed out there for the first time back in June and found more than 100 harbor seals lazing about, soaking up some rays, galumphing, I love that word, galumphing in and out of the ocean. It was pure delight. Uh, there were frolicking young pups and adults snoozing or swimming, uh, just like some of our beach days, right? <laughs> uh, but here's a video I took last September to give you a glimpse at a seal watch moment in time. So how utter fantastic, right? And amazing to be able to witness that. And you can hear, I think you might've heard some kids in the background. Um, people love it. People get so enthused. Children are just enthralled by the seals. And I uh, just feel like it, we're, we're just so fortunate to be able to, to have this wildlife viewing so close to home. Whoops. Okay. Uh, video. There we go. So a little bit of an overview for the next segment. We're going to briefly talk about seal watch history, uh, the habitat at the confluence of the Russian River and Pacific Ocean, uh, protections that are in place for the Jenner Harbor seals and why volunteering for Seal Watch matters, the role of a Seal Watch volunteer, interpreting the seals and their habitat, guiding the interpretation, making those connections for visitors, your shift duties and team up, which is the shared calendar we use to sign up for shifts, and then some continuing education and resources that I've uh, referenced earlier. So in 1985, Dion Hardy, who is still involved with Seal Watch, and other local activists from Jenner discovered that the harbor seals at Goat Rock State Beach were in greater danger from beach visitors and unleashed dogs than from the pollution of a recent sewage spill into the Russian River. In response to these concerns, they organized grassroots, organized shifts on the beach at the river mouth, where they educated visitors about the federally protected marine mammals at that beach. Thus began one of the first stewards supported programs, Seal Watch. Today, Stewards, Seal Watch volunteers continue to inform visitors of safe viewing distances and guide interpretation of the harbor seals and their habitat. This habitat is a popular one, clearly. The harbor seals share it with other marine mammals like California sea lions, a variety of amphibians, fish, and lots of seabirds like pelicans, cormorants, and common gulls. In fact, you could see hundreds of each seabird species during a single seal watch shift. It is truly magical and one of the best places for wildlife viewing. Other mammals like us humans also enjoy the seal's habitat. 
It draws thousands and thousands of human visitors from all over the world, country, excuse me, all over the state, country and world. We like to kayak, canoe, paddleboard, or walk along the sands of the river and ocean. Days are when we're most active, but it's also when seals rest and recover from a night of diving and nocturnal feeding. We're basically the rowdy neighbors next door while the seals are trying to get some shut eye after working all night. And this is where Seal Watch volunteers are critical. At this nexus of activities and shared space, by our presence and guiding interpretation of the seals and their habitat, volunteers aid the protection of the seals. Our presence and our efforts reduce uh, potential for pup abandonment from human disturbance and by creating connections for the visitors with the seals. They may begin to see the world a, a little differently than when they first arrived. This local direct experience with the seals and their pups at the hollow may just inspire folks to act and join the collective effort to promote conservation and protection of marine mammals, the ocean and our climate. Interpretation of the seals world creates emotional and intellectual connections that are carried back with the visitors to their worlds. And if we do that, we're successful. So just to orient you, some of you may be very familiar with the uh, Russian River mouth, where we set up to volunteer, where we park. Some of you may not be. So uh, the photo, these photos, by the way, are from our Seal Watch volunteer, Diane Monroe. Thank you, Diane. Um, so let's orient you to the seals haul out at the confluence. So if you look at the photo on your left, you can see um, a nice spread out haul out of harbor seals. Um, and that is viewing, you're looking north from uh, the goat rock side of the Russian river mouth. And the photo to the right is looking from the overlook on route one and you're looking south at Goat Rock and you can see the parking lot is up to, is, is towards the, the left of the photo in the back. You walk across that spit of sand to the Russian river mouth and that star is where you star volunteers pretty much hang out for um, our shift, Goat Rock shifts. And then across the river, of course, is the um, haul out. I think it's important to also mention that the Kashaya, Pomo, and Coast Miwok tribes were the first inhabitants and stewards of the Russian River area, estimated to have resided in the watershed as early as 5000 BCE. So the tribes have stewarded the land and waters for thousands of years. The Russian River is about 110 miles long and it flows from its headwaters near the Redwood and Potter Valleys into the Pacific Ocean. And that happens across from the town of Jenner. Uh, at, um, yeah, so that star is basically where we typically uh, have our shifts, but given the storms, we may be uh, adjusting to where the seals are now. They've changed their haul out. They're on the Goat Rock side, last I've heard. So we'll head out um, next week and we'll take a look at the configuration of the sand and the seals and the water. And, and um, But generally, this is where you would view the haul out and interpret from this area. All right, why volunteer? Why not just post signs? Well, some students at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo came up with this reason. <laughs> Heather, did you wanna turn your video on? 
There's no video to show. Okay. I meant your video um, as a speaker. Uh, no, I'm good. Okay. So the Cal Poly San Luis Obispo students entered a, fee, a contest for a public awareness campaign. So basically this is a little tongue in cheek method of um, alerting folks why it's important to maintain distance. And this was a competition that NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association sponsored. So yes, we volunteer in part to stop this from happening. <laughs> As mentioned, kayakers and beach visitors enjoy visiting the seals habitat too. So let's talk about the protections that are in place to keep seals safe and minimize human disturbances. And, you know, let, I will start my video if that's uh, a little bit better. Can you guys? Okay. Thank you, Justin. So we're going to talk a little bit about what protections are in place for the seals. Not only is harassing, disturbing, or feeding wildlife harmful to the animals, it's also illegal in many cases. There are a number of federal laws in place that protect marine wildlife, one of which is the Marine Mammal Protection Act, or the MMPA, which was passed by Congress in 1972. Among other protections for marine life and their ecosystems, it prohibits the take of marine mammals. The term take refers to the actions of harassing, disturbing, injuring, hunting, and killing marine mammals or any attempt to engage in such conduct. MMPA regulations also include feeding as a form of prohibited take. All marine mammals, including seals, sea lions, dolphins, and whales are protected under the MMPA. Marine protected areas or MPAs are places with valued habitats, species and features in our oceans, coasts, estuaries and great lakes that have been given long-term protection. We have an MPA along the Sonoma coast and there is a link under resources at the end of this presentation if you wanna learn more and there are also opportunities for training. The process for reporting disturbances or violations is kept handy in the seal watch field binder, which is kept in the backpack in the goat rock storage shed. More on that later, and we'll walk through all that on our February 25th training out at the beach. Um, but during a seal watch shift, you are most likely to observe a human disturbance of the harbor seals. Let's talk about what that looks like. So this is a great graphic, a great public awareness campaign by NOAA called Share the Shore. And uh, the three behaviors above, or excuse me, to, uh, shown are the three types of harassment under the MMPA. So while viewing marine wildlife, your actions should not cause a change in an animal's behavior. Individual animals' reactions will vary. So carefully observe all animals in the vicinity. Assume that your action is a disturbance and cautiously leave the area if you observe any of the following unusual behaviors. So in seals and seal lions, that might look like increased or rapid movements away from the disturbance, hurried entry into the water or herd movement toward the water. We will frequently refer to that as flushing increased vocalizations or loud exhalations known as chuffing. So there are three levels of harassment and what, you're, what this image is showing you are those three. So the first one is alerting. You know, is the animal, are the animals looking up and are they attending to the stimuli? That is a form, that is the first level of harassment under the MMPA. So they're alerted. They are sensing something that might be dangerous. That is a change in their behavior. So that is why it is considered harassment. The second level is they're disturbed. 
They start moving around, they're fidgeting, they're acting, they're, they look like they're acting nervous. They're disturbed, it's time for you to back away slowly. The next level of harassment is when they're fleeing um, or flushing. So they do not feel safe, they, you are too close, and they're going to flush back into the water, which is where they're safest. They know they're vulnerable on land, but they're much safer in the water. So all three levels of behavior are, are considered, is considered harassment. And um, we are, by our presence as SEAL Watch volunteers, we are hoping to reduce by our presence and our ability to educate and inform folks about those levels of harassment. If the SEAL's watching you, you're, we are now disturbing and impacting that SEAL's behavior. Um, so in addition to us being there, we're trying to, we're, we are trying to reduce human activity, right? That might result in separation of mothers and their young. Mothers may not return to the beach. Uh, if they are flushed, and that could end in the result of um, a pup being abandoned. Uh, we could cause disruption of migratory patterns. We could disrupt resting activities that we've already, that Dr. Um, Allen reviewed. We could be interfering with their breeding, their reproductive and rearing activities. And this is why we generally ask visitors to abide by the MMPA minimum distances of 50 yards from seals, whether they're on the beach or in the water. So we talked a little bit about the danger that dogs pose to, to um, marine mammals and in particular harbor seals. You will encounter folks with dogs on your shifts, some off leash, some on leash, but dogs are not allowed on Goat Rock State Beach. Here are some simple talking points to use when engaging dog owners. You wanna introduce yourself. You wanna be friendly and be sure to smile. Your message will be received better if you're smiling and if you're friendly. Choose a few of these talking points, but put them in your own words, put them in a conversational tone, and again, be friendly. Use the word I, not you. For example, I noticed your dog, or my understanding is, as opposed to you're not allowed to bring a dog on the beach. Um, that puts people back on their heels and it could escalate the conversation. Share the location of Blind Beach, which is the adjacent beach to the south, to Goat Rock, which actually allows dogs on leash. Give them a flyer on where you can take dogs on the Sonoma coast. And those flyers are kept in the um, backpack that is kept uh, at the storage shed at Goat Rock. And we will talk more about speaking with the public in our training on 225 at the beach. As tempting as it is, and I've done this, I've, I've slipped, do not tell people to leave the beach in so many words. Um, this could make the situation worse. We are not enforcement. If necessary, report egregious violations to State Park Dispatch. And again, that information is in the field binder. And note the presence of the dogs on the shift report, which we will review in a little bit. Remember that education and friendliness will go much further in getting the message across. And again, this is that photo that Dr. Allen also shared, photography by Diane Monroe. And this is a mother pup, a mother and her pup at the Jenner Hallout. And another moment taken during a seal watch shift, beautifully captured by Diane Monroe. No better way to spend an afternoon. So a little bit about tools uh, that you have for a Goat Rock beach shift. 
and we'll review these when we're actually out on site. But the storage shed has equipment. We have a two-way radio. Um, cell service is a challenge. We'll get into that later. Um, you'll have a backpack with a field binder, binoculars, a scope to share with the public. And um, there's rope, a mallet, and fence stakes in the storage shed, which all um, volunteers will access at the beginning of their shifts to get, to get their equipment. The field binder is gonna contain emergency contacts, radio instructions, shift reports, um, lots of resources to share with folks, um, for you to sit in those quiet moments and read and learn. Um, best practices for speaking with the public, tips on interpretation, the Marine Mammal Center Guide that identifies uh, the various pinnipeds and some tools for being able to evaluate their body condition. And some field guide and a field guide to California coastal birds. It's a great spot for birding. So there's a lot of info in the field binder. Um, but please bring your own sunscreen, wear layers. Uh, sunglasses, snacks, water, etc. All those things would be good tools for your goat rock shift. So I mentioned uh, about the shift reports. So shifts are Saturdays and Sundays from 11 to 2. That's the morning shift. And the afternoon shift is from 2 to 5. We have a new location we'll talk about in a minute uh, at the Jenner boat launch. And those shifts are from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. on Saturday and Sunday. But this is a, the world, the, the uh, preview of the new shift report for Seal Watch. It's a little different for you veterans. Each shift is gonna have, um, uh, one sheet per shift. So you will enter your volunteer names, who's there for that shift, the time, the date, weather conditions, whether the river mouth is open or closed. And when you checked in with the Gender Visitor Center, again, we'll go into those details, was the radio answered when you checked in? And then what we'd like you to do is to tabulate the number of visitors you engaged with during the shift. Sometimes it might be a dozen, sometimes it could be upwards of 80 people. Put those, just tally those um, hash marks and, and total those out for us. And then we ask that you do some counts. And we want, we would love to know how many harbor seal adults did you see? How many pups? Did you see a sea lion? Um, you might see one or two popping up in the, in the surf. You likely won't see elephant seals, but if you don't, put a, put a zero, don't leave any blanks. You might spot uh, a whale, you might see the spout come up, mark that. And if you're really, really lucky, you get to witness a harbor seal birth. And we would love for you to note that so that we can include that in our data collections. And then if you, if you happen to observe an animal that appears ill, or injured, we would like to know that as well. And again, we don't, we're don't. we not asking you to diagnose, just write your observations. Sometimes you might see like a bloody flipper, you might see a laceration, anything that you observe, just note it. And then was the Marine Mammal Center contacted? It could be yes or no. And then the other information we'd like to gather is were there dogs on the beach? Uh, how many did dogs did you witness during your shift on Goat Rock? How many on the north side of the river mouth? And how many along the estuary? And if you have any descriptions or additional information, please uh, include that as well. There's a space for you to write that. And did you observe flushing? And what were the causes of the flushing? Did you see a dog flush the seals into the water? Um, did you, was it a kayaker who got too close? Was it a loud vehicle on Route 1 that blew an air horn? I witnessed that last summer. And if, it, it, and maybe it wasn't flushing. Maybe it caused a lot of alerts. Maybe we saw some nervous behavior. So we would love to have you 
share that so that we can also collect that data. And then there's space for you to add any comments at the bottom, and then you can always write on the reverse side of the shift report. So I talked about seal counts. <laughs> no, do not, do not feel like it has to be exact. When I count seals out there, it's like a plus or minus 10, 15, because they're moving. They're at a distance. They, you might not even, is that a piece of driftwood or is that a seal? Um, sometimes it's really hard to distinguish where one starts and the other stops. So just do your best to do a count. There have been times uh, in July that we had over 300 count, uh, animals counted. Do your best to distinguish between pups and adults. Again, uh, don't worry if um, you can't. This is, again, just some general ideas of what we're looking at. So uh, again, some of you might be very familiar with this area. I was not when I started. So I'm going to assume that there's some folks on here that are not too familiar with all of these points of reference. So this is an aerial of the, the Russian River mouth and estuary. So uh, the Jenner boat launch that I mentioned previously is a new location for Seal Watch is next to the Jenner Visitor Center. And that is a visitor center that stewards also manages and operates. So we will have volunteers stationed at the Jenner boat launch. And your primary um, audience would be visitors to Jenner that, are, that might come by and ask you some questions about the general area, about the harbor seals. Um, and then you'll also, your other audience, and the main reason why we're there is so that we can uh, educate and inform and be of service to the kayakers and others using that boat launch. So because the kayakers will, and other water enthusiasts, they'll, if you can see my pointer, they will leave the launch, they'll paddle west, and as they come around this corner, this is Goat Rock Beach. And we're usually stationed here at the mouth. The seals are over here. And this is Sea Lion Rest Place. Uh, it used to be many, many, many years ago, but the harbor seals evicted them. And now it's um, all harbor seals. Uh, but our kayakers will come along here and they will typically come into this cove and some will actually land and come out, get come out of their kayaks and kind of walk along this northern end of the, of the coastline. Sometimes kayakers will get too close to these seals as they're hauled out. And that's what we're trying to educate and, and hopefully reduce uh, the occurrence. So we want to talk to our, our kayakers, our visitors. We want to inform them of the need to remain at least 100, 150 feet back from harbor seals, whether in their water or on the sand. And again, you'll have a lot of talking points and materials in your field binder to assist you. And so what, we're, what our efforts are here, we'll have a volunteer on the Goat Rock Beach. We'll have a volunteer at the Jenner Boat Launch. And those are kind of the two um, points where we can catch people before they get to the seals and hopefully inform them and educate them so they make better decisions. So a little bit about tools that you'll have for the Jenner boat launch. Uh, as I said, uh, you, the, the goal, the objective of this, of this location is to proactively engage with kayakers and boaters launching from Jenner about the colony and safe viewing distances so that we reduce disturbances and further protect that population. Many are not aware that approaching the colony within, 100, within 50 yards um, is not only a violation of federal law, 
but it may cause pup abandonment. And during pupping season, that education is critical. Sometimes kayakers even have dogs with them and they will head to that north side of the river mouth to walk the beach with their dog, not knowing that dogs are not allowed. So again, our aim is to inform and educate so that behavior changes. And we'll review best practices and messaging for that audience in our on-site training on February 25th. And again, our communications will be geared to um, water enthusiasts. So your role as a seal watch volunteer, it, and there might be some confusion, there might be, it might be unclear. Um, we are stewards, we are docents, and we guide interpretation. We help to create emotional and intellectual connections for visitors with the harbor seals and their larger ecosystem. We are not enforcers. We're not enforcement. It is tempting to cross that line out of concern for the seals, but that is not our role. It's not safe and it is a recipe for burnout. Our role may include informing visitors of regulations that protect the seals and visitors, such as the MMPA, but we do not enforce them. And enforcement could be telling people to leave the beach. That is not our role. You have support. Interacting with the public can be at times challenging. Take a rest during your shift if necessary. Reach out to your seal watch buddy uh, or coordinator. If you need to share an experience that might be difficult, that may have um, left you upset, reach out to enforcement agencies when a situation is best for them to address or manage. We are educators, we're storytellers, we're guides for interpretation. And there are wonderful resources on the stewards website and at the end of this presentation. Um, so please take advantage of those opportunities, learn more about marine mammals, their ecosystems and climate science. So I, I, I've kind of thrown around this word interpretation, um, but what does that mean? So we're going to have that training on the 25th that I've already mentioned a few times. And uh, interpretation was defined by the National um, Park Service as interpretation facilitates a connection between the interests of the visitor and the meanings of the resource. The National Association of Interpretation defined it as a communication process that forges emotional and intellectual connections between the interests of the audience and the meanings of the resource. So what features of a visitor's experience may create that connection? How can the features be relevant to the visitor and their world? And we'll discuss the tools we use to help create these connections for visitors on the 25th. David Berman will lead the interpretation exercises out at Goat Rock Beach. And then we'll wrap up there and we'll head over, drive on over to the Jenner boat launch. And we'll review how to discuss safe viewing of seals with boaters and kayakers. Are you ready to dive in? So once you are ready, your paperwork's done, um, you're now a Seal Watch volunteer, we will uh, share the Team Up Calendar link with you, but I will quickly show you what that looks like. Oh, okay, it's not letting me. One second. It worked in my test, so I'm gonna do 
I'm going to try to share my other screen. There you go. Can you see this now? The it, it's, it's still showing the slide. I think if you do, uh, if you oh, I didn't hit share. Thank you. There we go. There you go. Yep. You see team team up now. Yes. Beautiful. So you're going to be brought to this dashboard, and I have multiple calendars here. You likely won't. Um, you will go to your stewards program volunteer um, sign up page and I will go to February. So you'll see, you might actually, when you first sign in, you might see this. These are all of our calendars in stewards that uses team up. Uh, it's a little confusing. So you just want to come over to the left margin here. You want to find seal watch and then just click on that eyeball. And that shows the seal watch calendar only. So I'm going to sign up for the seal watch goat rock shift on March 5th. Actually, I'm going to do the afternoon shift. I want to sign up for the two to five o'clock shift. I'm going to click on that. This window opens. And I'm going to hit sign up. I'm going to put my name, which is already there. I'm going to put in my phone number. So folks know to call me if they would like to coordinate. And I'm going to hit save. So there I am, Heather Rowe and my phone number. I can also add a comment. I can say, please join me on my shift if you are a new volunteer and we can buddy up and I'm just going to hit say oh before I hit save you can also come over here and you can hit share and you can actually save it to one of your calendars so then I'm going to hit save and I should be able to close out and there I am one out of two shifts and say, we would like to have two folks for each shift so you can <laughs> and be that second person that would join me. So we can go into this, but I want to just share this to, with you so you have a little bit of familiarity. And, um, and I would just mention too, um, steward staff is also happy to help with people if you need help getting signed up and using team up. It's a new new tool that we've been using, and it's a really effective one for coordinating volunteers. Thank you, Heather. Great, thank you. Yes, that's a thank you, Justin. Great reminder. So we do need monthly seal watch coordinators to support the team. It's a long season. It starts in March and it ends Labor Day weekend that Monday. So um, we don't want to burn anybody out. We definitely need help. You can be a coordinator when you're brand new. Don't um, don't feel like you don't you don't have enough experience. It doesn't matter if you're just good at reaching out to folks and rallying up some shift coverage. That's what we need you to help with. Let us know if you want to to be a coordinator, and basically you would cover a month. So let's seal the deal. I had to do it. So you want to complete your onboarding with Stewards of the Coast and Redwoods if you have not yet. So if you want to sign up to volunteer with Stewards, the link is here. Uh, please watch the general orientation video from January if you are not able to attend that. That will show you the ins and outs of getting onboarded with the California State Parks. You will become a California State Park volunteer. You will need to record your hours with the state. And all of that is covered in that orientation video. Uh, sign up for shifts, as I, I just demonstrated through Team Up, and complete the next portion of our Seal Watch training. And that again is on February 25th at 10 a.m. at Goat Rock Beach. And sign up once you're once you are logged in and registered at, at Team Up. Sign up for at least one shift a month. That's all we ask. One shift, one three-hour shift a month, and more, of course, 
will ensure that we have volunteers for every weekend shift to help support the SEALs. At the end of this PDF, which well, I will share with, uh, with uh, attendees, all of these links are live. There's just a lot of good resources here. Um, I learned something, I just, just the, the ending, the learning is endless. It is such an amazing um, field of study. So you can lose yourself into any of these websites and have fun. If you're on social media, we ask that you um, use some so social media tips, uh, you know, use hashtags in your photos, spread the word, get that larger audience. And this is just some sample hashtags that you can use. Follow the accounts of organizations that address climate change, ocean science, the Sonoma Coast and marine mammals. Share their content, learn from their content. Share your photos and experiences to educate, inspire, and increase awareness. Thank you very, very much. Um, I will open it up for questions. I have a question. Um, while we're promoting the, uh, you know, with, with some of the social media stuff, if we want to do outreach to the community to rally additional volunteers, I mean, obviously we've gone through a, you know, beginner introduction here um, for some of us who've done it and some of us who haven't. Um, but if we want to rally new volunteers, what's the best way to do that and to assure that they're going to receive the information they need to be effective? Justin, do you want to take that question? Uh, oh, sure. I'll, you know, um, it's a great question. It's uh, something that we work on with all of our volunteer programs. Um, you know, uh, the the best places to you know, effectively recruit volunteers uh, are community oriented. Um, an example would be, you know, this training itself to get people here. Um, Heather reached out to the Sea Watch Working Group and others that have been a part of the program to do a, a mass flyering event where flyers were posted at different uh, local events, uh, different, you know, event posting boards and local communities like at your, your post office and things like that. So I guess I guess my question is, if I do rally volunteers, because I'm kind of plugged yeah. into the community, if I if I find, you know, three or two or five or, you know, people that want to volunteer, what's the, you know, and we've done this fairly extensive training, well, mm -hmm. a beginner training, um, what, how do, how do people, how can people plug in since obviously they haven't participated in this program? How do you bring in people during the year when, you know, obviously you're not doing this training all the time. The best way to- I will jump yeah. in. I will yeah. jump in. There are plans to have um, this training throughout the season. So we would like to do the training again in April. We'd like to do the training again in June. And the reason being is when I looked back at shift reports and um, shift coverage in previous years, we start, volunteers start kind of falling off by midsummer right, from a number of reasons, whether they're on vacation, whether, um, you know, it, it it's burnout sometimes, the weather out there can be a little rough. Sometimes talking with the public can be a little rough. So what we're hoping for is to create more support with our volunteers, having that buddy system, <laughs> having somebody to talk to, and having this pipeline of new volunteers coming through Seal Watch so that this isn't the one and done training for the, for the entire season. So what I would tell you to share is send people to the website. First thing I would do is share the website. There is an entire page of, of recorded trainings that they can view and that can qualify as being trained. They don't have to be um, in our live trainings. So there are a lot of folks that were not available to be here today, but this training will be posted on the website for later viewing. Um, so yeah, go to our website, view um, some of those trainings. Go ahead, Justin, you were going to say something? Yeah, no, and I just want to add too, it's, um, we want to meet people where they're at, including based on their level of interest. So like everybody that's here right now, you know, might have a cursory 
level of interest might be a little bit more interested. Some folks have been doing it for a long time. Um, a great way to just invite people to get involved to see if uh, they might be interested is to have them shadow you on a shift. So what we're doing right now and everything that we're discussing is to become a, a long-term California State Parks volunteer. Um, there's You can also you know, just put your name on a one page piece of paper and come show up and shadow and learn on the job and see if it's uh, something that you like the, the taste of, you know, try your different flavors and see if you like it. So we want to be accommodating for the various places that people are at with their interests. Heather, when we're signing up for shifts, um, is there a maximum number of uh, people to sign up per shift? I, my wife and I would like to sign up together. So we ask for at least two volunteers per shift. Sorry, oh. my dog is bossing me. Um, we ask for at least two volunteers per shift. The more the merrier. If there's, okay. more, if, if there's you and your wife want to, join, uh, uh, sign up for a shift, that's wonderful. If somebody else also wants to attend and there's already two signed up and there isn't a spot for a third, that's fine. Don't worry about it. Just make sure we note that on the shift report so I know exactly how many people were on that shift. Okay. And, and honestly, you know, the, we had four hour shifts before, now they've been reduced to three hours because it can be a little tiring. You're talking to folks all that time. <laughs> we really like having more than one person out at the shift because it gives the opportunity for someone to go sit down, maybe take a walk, recenter. Um, so please, if you see only one person signed up, it's better than none, but please join them so that you guys can, can give each other a break and you can complement each other with your interactions with folks. Thank you. Um, I had a question. Um, where exactly are we meeting um, at Goat Rock? Out at the mouth of the river or in the parking lot? Yeah, or? We'll, we'll send out an email with, with some, again, with some specifics, but you're going to meet in that northern parking lot. So you want to park at the northern end of Goat Rock. Okay. And um, get there a few minutes early. We'll start sharp at 10. We'll walk over to the storage shed that is... Um, kind of just before you enter the, the the parking lot, there's an entrance to the Rangers home. It's in that little driveway. We'll walk over there from the, once we park and gather and we'll open the shed. We'll go through all the equipment, make sure you're comfortable. From that point, after about 10 minutes there or so, we'll head to the, the mouth of the river and then we'll do some interpretive exercises. You'll get get your feel. We'll see where the seals are. And then when we wrap up there, we'll drive over to Jenner and we'll do like that training um, 2.0 for Jenner and we'll shift our focus to engaging with kayakers and the general public. Okay, great, thank you. And I do see in chats and I, and I, I thought I added it in my slides, but I guess I didn't. So, this week, this coming week, uh, on the 17th, we're going to head out, a few of us are going to head out to the beach, and we're going to install some signage, excuse me, some fencing and ropes with some signage. So uh, at the beginning of pupping season every year, we, we install si um, fence posts with some cotton rope, with some signs affixed to those stakes, alerting people for the need to remain um, 150 feet away from the animals. It serves as a visual barrier for folks. And that is also something that we do for Seal Watch. We maintain, when we go out there, we maintain those fences, those ropes, sometimes they blow over, sometimes we have to move them. Um, and there's a mallet that will be put in the storage box so that you can help drive those stakes into the sand. But we'll get into all that on the 25th. So Heather, you're not asking us to help with that job. So if you want to join us on the 17th, we'll meet, we'll meet at Goat Rock at 2 p.m. The more the merrier. Um, you're, everyone is welcomed to join us. Um, we'll have a, a, a great group of folks that way, and it's easier, and it's a good introduction to the to the location. 
And, and uh, my email, I'm going to put my email in the chat. You are all welcomed to email me. If you'd like to join on the 17th at 2 p.m. at Goat Rock, or if you have any general questions at all, I'll also put my phone number in. And I, whoops, I missed a digit. That's important. Um, please don't be shy. I'm, I, you know, I knew nothing. I went out, I did seal watch myself, my first shift. I had no idea what I was doing. I was there by myself. <laughs> I just figured it out. Um, I don't want anyone to have to do that. I don't want you to have to do your first shift by yourself. So we will um, as we will buddy you up with another volunteer. Uh, we are all accessible and available to answer your questions. Can I ask one more thing, Heather? Please. If we go to sign up for a shift, how do we know we're going to be buddied up with a, a veteran? So that's a good, that's a really good question. Um, you know, we can, you can sign up for team up and then um, the more seasoned folks, we can be monitoring that calendar and we can make sure that the new volunteers have somebody sign up for that shift with them. I think that might be the best way to do it. Um, Carol, and Deborah, um, do you have any additional thoughts on that? Suggestions? I guess we could just, um, maybe if they had our phone numbers, they could call and say, hey, I wanna sign up. Are you gonna be out there or something like that? Yeah, so we can share the email addresses and phone numbers of, um, some of the seasoned veteran seal watchers. And again, you can coordinate, but what I would, what I definitely would love you to do is sign up and team up because that's a way of us also identifying which shifts need coverage. So if I know that Saturday's covered and I don't see anyone on Sunday, I'll, I'll, I'll try to join on a Sunday shift. So it's really important that if we know you're going, that you will be out there, that it is in the team up because we're making decisions our scheduled decisions based on on coverage need. And team up is on the website. Team up will be linked from the website. We will also share the calendar with you in an email and then you can register and log in and start signing up. Right. Yeah, and that's a good point. Thank you, Carol. So yes, so you saw me write that comment in team up when I signed up for that shift. Carol mentioned in the chat, new volunteers can add comment when signing up that a veteran is needed. I think this is a role for the monthly coordinator also. Yeah, yeah, the court, exactly. As we start getting into the seal watch season, this is something the coordinator would help coordinate. I have a question. If um, if we can only attend for, let's say you're only available for two hours, is it better to not sign up online and just go so that someone else takes the full shift? So I think ideally, of course, ideally, we, we would love a full shift to be completed. But absolutely, if you're able to only do two hours on a day, sign up and just make that in the in the comment. Put that in the comment. I will be there from 11 to 1 or I, I will be there from 3 to 5. Um, so yes, absolutely. We would still welcome you to do. And then when you're at the shift and you're filling out your shift report, just put that in, in the time. Okay. I was just wondering if, if it's better to not sign up on the calendar so that it doesn't look like there's full coverage. Yeah. You know? but no, I, think, I think, I think it's, I, if it's a one-off, I, I don't see a problem with it. But if it's a continuous, like I'm only available two hours, then maybe we take it offline and figure out how we work around that. Sure. Will new people be signing up for shifts before the 25th of February? We're going to be registering and all that. Will we be expected to sign up for shifts before then? Not necessarily. Not necessarily right. before the 25th. Well, okay. They could. You can. The team up is now, I mean, the, the, the calendar is now up and 
and you're able to sign up for shifts once you get the, the URL for it. Um, but yeah, if you want to sign up now, we have one of our volunteers, Patrick, who's already signed up his one shift each month well into the summer. So feel free if you have some, some shifts already in mind, get them on the team up calendar that helps inform others of when the, how they can schedule their time with Seal Watch. Um, but no, a lot of people just kind of also the day before will sign up for shifts. Not ideal because others are making decisions based on coverage, but um, yeah, no, there's no need to do it before the 25th. Okay. And Erica had a really great, great um, suggestion. I love that. Veterans can also place a symbol next to their name and phone number. Let's put vet after our names. Maybe, um, uh, maybe we we uh, don't want that to be confused with veterinarian. I don't know. Oh, good <laughs> idea. Do you have a suggest something different? <laughs> Yeah, let's we'll figure out what that might be. Um, but I think Justin is is miming. We're out of time. Does that is that what you're doing? Are we out of time? <laughs> you're on mute, Justin. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, we're we are uh, out of out of time. Um, people are welcome to stay, but I really wanted to start uh, by thanking Heather so much um, for putting this incredible training together. It's been really helpful. There's been Lots of good, clear information, good communication, um, and lots of learning from various stakeholders that are involved in protecting this resource. And um, I think you did a terrific job in getting people excited to come out. And I hope to see everybody at the next one, February 25th. I will stay on for a little bit if people want to ask questions. Thank, Thank you, Justin. You. Thank you for hosting. Hi, Heather. 